This is Jocko Podcast number 335 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. When the Navy's academics had arrived in 1955 to observe UDT training, their purpose had been to validate the course's individual selection tests. The soft sand runs, the ocean swims, the harassment of Hell Week, and short of invalidating any of those to develop what they called realistic selection standards that would reduce the Navy, what the Navy admitted was the course's excessive attrition. Subjecting students to a battery of personality tests and classifying their individual traits, age, education, intelligence, and so on, the academics hoped not only to predict a candidate's likelihood of success in training, but also his success in an actual underwater demolition team. In the course of these assessments, they learned that students below the age of 21 were 8% more likely to fail roughly the same rate as high school dropouts, while students from broken homes were just as likely to graduate as anyone else. Based on the number of times a student had voluntarily visited the dispensary, assessors determined that a candidate in moderate health who, quote, minimized the psychological importance of pain, fatigue, and intense discomfort stood a much higher chance of success than, quote, the most physically fit who were overly concerned about their injuries. The least common traits among successful frogmen seem to be restraint, thoughtfulness, sociability, and cautiousness. The most common were responsibility, emotional stability, original thinking, objectivity, and most of all, masculinity. Later studies had gone on to test a variety of variables, including the benefits of wheat germ in a student's diet, which proved particularly negligible, and a series of Rorschach tests and psychiatric interviews to determine the effect of sexuality on a candidate's success or failure. Successful frogmen, said the sex, sex reports author, appear to require this specific, rather masculine and adventurous occupation with all its self-destructive and masochistic implications because, and this was just the author's speculation of their magical attraction to the depth of the sea and the security of the womb, and an unconscious motivation to prove their masculinity coupled with a fear of involvement with women. Setting aside the psychoanalyst's tendency to project their own insecurities onto their subject, the Navy had not been able to argue with the UDT's results. I have never met a group of more self-reliant, hell-for-leather characters, wrote reporter Bill Stapleton after accompanying a UDT to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands in 1955. Besides their typical reconnaissance exercises, submarine lockouts, and tests with miniature submersibles, the frogmen had also salvaged a 50-foot yacht from a reef, twisted the tails of passing sharks, and, when an American sailor had disappeared into a harbor on a moonless night, had commandeered a truck, roared to the wharf's edge, and, as if they had been scouting the contours of an enemy beach, dove online until they found the drowned man. In their free time, they spearfished, drank untold amounts of beer, erected beachside bonfires, and in overflowing pots of seawater and vinegar, boiled lobsters and astonished the superstitious natives by broiling barracuda steaks. You eat barracuda, barracuda eat you, they had said. Promises, replied a frogman, nothing but promises. So exclusive were the UDTs, said one observer, that even rank meant nothing to them. When seen in their standard swim trunks and knife belts, surrounded by charts and diving equipment, and asked by passerbys if they were indeed in the Navy, the frogmen would invariably reply, regardless of the asker's rank, nope, we're all in UDT. (sighs) So that right there is an excerpt from a Incredible book. The book is called By Water Beneath the Waves. It's written by a former SEAL named Ben Milligan. And it's it's an outstanding history of where the SEAL teams come from. But that little excerpt describing what a UDT man was like back in the day, 
That assessment is from 1955. So at that time, there were no SEAL teams. But but the spirit, the soul of the frogman was there in full form, and this is where the modern-day SEALs come from. Those were our roots. Those were our forefathers. And it is an honor to have one of those old-school frogmen with us today to tell us about his experiences in the underwater demolition teams, what he learned there, and how he applied those lessons throughout the rest of his life. His name is Lance Mann, a UDT frogman, a waterman, a surfer, an entrepreneur, a lifeguard, and a damn good example of how to live life. Lance, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Appreciate it. That that uh, <clears throat> assessment in 1955, I feel like I know half those guys that yeah. he's talking about. Yeah. Like these are the yeah. guys I grew up with in the teams. Right. And right. pretty interesting that it just, there's something about it that stays. Like there's something about that old frogman that stays. Well, and I think what the, in the training and the, I guess the buzz, if you will, and then the, the subsequent, I don't even know what, what all you do to become a SEAL today. I, uh, <laughs> it's, um, but uh, they, I, I'm always uh, struck by how, um, how much a part of the old days is, is inculcated into the modern day trainee and uh in the buzz candidate and i uh and it always kind of catches me off guard i mean i i, I love the teams and and when i i was about i read something like that about five years subsequent to that to when that was written <clears throat> and uh i think reader's digest had a deal <laughs> in 1961 or something like that and i was a senior in college and i I was reading that puppy, and I said, "Yeah, yeah the, you know." And I, I didn't really even want to go in the military, but I, when I put that down, I said, "Well, <laughs> if I have to go in the military, I'm going to do that because that, that sounds really cool." And uh, so it it um, it resonated with me, and uh, and it's interesting to me that <clears throat> it seems like a big part of the SEAL training. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And it's it's great. I mean, as an old guy, that uh, <laughs> when I meet guys and when they, they hear these guys that could do so much more than I could for crying out loud, and and then they're being they're giving me credit for something that man, I don't know if I had that in me, but by gum I'll take it. So so thank you. Well, let's let's t- let's get there. Uh, let's go all the way back to the beginning. To, to where you know to where you grew up and how you grew up just to kind of get a, a feel for where you came from so when, when were you born I was born in uh, in 1939 and and uh, so my dad you know he was he was a, a hard-working guy he had just got finished with graduate school and he was he was starting his corporate career, and, and as a consequence, uh, we moved a couple of times. But then, when the Second World War broke out, he he signed up uh, with the Navy. He was a navigator uh, in the, in I don't, I don't I can't remember, I don't know what. So you were born in thirty nine. Thirty nine. Here's your dad, a couple years into his corporate career, maybe a year or two. Yes, and that was just what guys were doing. Yes. When the war broke out, didn't matter what you were doing. You had a family. You got young kids. Right. You're you, going. You're going. Or, or, or you, or you were, or you had some kind of occupation where they needed you in it, and so they didn't want you in the military. They wanted you to keep going with whatever you were doing. Do you have any idea why he wanted to go in the Navy? I don't know why Dad did that, but uh, because of that, we moved everywhere. Mm-hmm. We lived in Hollywood, Florida. We lived in. Uh, uh, San Francisco, and we were all over the place, and we must have moved. And by the time I was about four or five years old and started going to school, I think I had a, went to about five kindergartens. You know, so, <laughs> so, and then, uh, and then uh, about three or four first grades, and then second grade, we, I went down to one, and then third, and then I went to 
the same school for third, fourth, and a month and a half of fifth grade. So I, I moved around a lot. And the, your dad was in the Navy the whole time? Is that what he, was going well, on? Well, uh, when uh, he, he got, let me see, in 1945, I was six, so I was in first grade, and that's when the number of schools that I matriculated and kind of <laughs> tapered down a little bit, and so we settled down. But, uh, Did he get out of the Navy in 45 after the yeah. war? Okay. Yeah, he uh, he went and he became an, an administrative assistant to a U.S. senator from New Jersey that uh, knew him as a young kid uh, going to uh, business school. Mm-hmm. And so then we kind of settled down in the D.C. area for a couple of years and then moved to up around New York. And what were you what were you into when you were a kid? What were you doing? Oh, nothing very <laughs> worthwhile. I, 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 it, was, it was one of those deals where you lived in a neighborhood and uh, you, your baseball team might have 13 guys on it, you know, and uh, that's the way it was growing up in, you know, like in, in New Jersey in a town outside of New York City and then uh, just a bunch of kids getting together doing, doing sports stuff in Porter Park, I remember, in Montclair and uh, – and so we did that kind of thing. Nothing too organized. But then... Um, and, and what about by the time you got into high school? Where'd you go to high school? Well, I, it's funny. Uh, I went to a school in Montclair in fifth grade, and it was, um, and I met some good friends there. And the kids, um, uh, all my buddies ended up, going to, um, I think it was Montclair Academy for sixth grade up. And uh, my parents said, well, no, you're going to go to Hillside Junior High School instead. So I said, jeez, okay. Uh, so I, I did, but I, I, by the time I was in eighth or ninth grade, it, be, it, it became clear to me why I didn't go to the private school in sixth grade. That's because my parents were probably saving up to send me off to uh, boarding school in New England. And so I, I went to high school at Deerfield Academy in, in Western Massachusetts. And so that is that like one of the old school, like all boys prep yeah. schools? coat and tie. Coat and tie. Yeah, no girls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was gnarly. <laughs> you, uh, <clears throat> it, but uh, yeah, it, it was. Um, it was. It's a great school. Uh, it was probably a lot better school than I was a student. But <laughs> I be, thank thank goodness for uh, for swimming because I joined the swim team and I I wasn't a great swimmer, but I was pretty good and uh, and that, luckily I had some. You know, so I felt at home at Deerfield because of swimming, and not not because of the academics too much. I mean, I got through them, but it was a struggle, and I don't think I embarrassed my parents by, but I I got through okay. And and this is so. This is the what late fifties. That's good. I I was there what in the fall of fifty four. I graduated in uh, nineteen fifty seven as a. And then went to college in 1958. Did you have a car? In between, I got a car in 19... Well, no, not until I left Deerfield. Okay. Yeah, that was it. See, some of the kids, some of those kids, they graduate and they get a new car. (laughs) (laughs) How was that? It just seemed like cars back then were so epic. Oh, yeah. No. And... Even though cars, I think the car, I mean, even today in America, we kind of, we we definitely focus on cars, and that's usually the biggest purchase a a person makes until they're maybe 30 and they finally buy a house. But up until then, it's like, what car are you getting? Yep. And back then, it seemed like it was even more so. Oh, it was unbelievable. I remember this guy, Joe Willard, in my class, and he's really a neat guy. And I I remember... uh, when graduation weekend came along and he was going down Albany Road in Deerfield, which is, you know, just kind of a country town kind of a place, and he had this this 
50 foot long gray <laughs> o- 98 Oldsmobile and there was Joe man and, and it was perfect and he was cruising down there waving and king of the world king kind of. of the world yeah <laughs> yeah and where'd you end up going to college <laughs> I I ended up going to Tulane University in uh, okay. New Orleans and it was a uh, I don't know you know, you got to, you know, there is a say, you know, when you're religious, you know, they're saying, you know, hey, God has a plan for you. And, and so all you need to do is just lighten up and go along with the program. And <clears throat> I certainly didn't have that kind of oh, spiritual sig- uh, significance inculcated in me at that point. However, <laughs> Uh, you talk about a guy who had no clue of what was going on, but somebody must have because when I left Deerfield, I, I think I was the only kid in my class that had no college that was going to take me. And so <laughs> my parents got me into this great college in, in Wisconsin called Lawrence College at the time, and they were good friends with the president of the college. So. He, he says, yeah, okay, yeah. I'll. <laughs> a mercy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A mercy admission. So yeah, I, I went there, and uh, uh, it turned out that um, we went down for to two, uh, to New Orleans because my I had an aunt that lived there, and we went there for spring break, and I looked around, and I said, and they said, I said, is there, there's a college around here, you know? <laughs> and uh, sure enough, there was uh, Tulane University, and luckily, um, I had an uncle that was uh, Tulane at that time. Well, I think always has always been known for its uh, medical school. And I had an uncle that was a doctor, and he was pretty prominent around New Orleans. And and so he he got me into Tulane, you know, as a <laughs> transfer student. Did and you, so, when you got down to New was New Orleans? So this is so now we're talking fifty fi- fifty eight uh, uh, fifty nine yeah, maybe. In the fall of '59, because yeah. you're, well, well, I mean, when you got up to Wisconsin, yeah. was that just like cold that you just thought to yourself, "I got to get out of Wisconsin"? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, and also my, by this time, my parents had moved there, and I loved my parents; we were close and everything. But I'd already done time at a boarding school, and so I was away from home. So living with my parents just wasn't part of the program anymore, you know. I, <laughs> And so uh, I, I thought, gee, I gotta, I gotta get on my own here. So I, I and that really was a big part of going to Tulane. And I, I was really stoked with New Orleans and the, the South. The first time that I went to New Orleans, we were I was in a SEAL platoon. I was a new guy, and we were <laughs> flying to go to Herbert Field in Florida. Oh, okay. And for some reason, the air crew had a planned stop from from San Diego. We were flying to Horbert Field, Florida, and for some reason we had to stop for a night in New Orleans, like for some unknown reason, right? Yeah, it couldn't have been it's Plano, t- Texas. Yeah, it's a Tuesday night, and all the guys are like, oh, we're going, we're going to Bourbon Street. And I'm thinking it's yeah. Tuesday night, and I'm, of course I'm, I'm not even old enough to drink, so I'm kind of just going along with whatever's going along. And I thought to myself, well, Tuesday night, maybe we'll go get some dinner or what. I just wasn't really expecting much. We got down to Bourbon Street on a Tuesday night. It was complete and utter mayhem. It was chaos. Yeah. There was people drinking, you know, girls taking their freaking clothes off. It was yeah. why it was yeah. insane. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How does that? So, so was that kind of the gig when you showed up there in 1958? Was it similar? Was it that much of a party town back then too? Oh, for sure. And. <laughs> I uh, I was pretty straight arrow, and uh, I think I had my well, I had my first beer, I think, in uh, my freshman year up in Wisconsin, and there, and, and had I had great friends in that in, in my fraternity there, and so we drank a little bit of beer, but uh, I really it I kind of honed it to a fine art by the time I got down to New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, New Orleans is it's it's. I think it's I, you know I've been around I've moved a yeah. lot and I I uh, about five or six years ago I was thinking my favorite city in the in the United States it it, it has to be New Orleans I was <laughs> only there for college uh, and then a, a few years later we did some business down there but 
Yeah, there's something very, very unique about New Orleans. It's wild. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. my, my platoon commander, <clears throat> this was also in my first platoon, I think on our way back or something, we have another weird random stop in New Orleans, but he went to Tulane. Oh, so he made inroads and we showed up at like a party where some kind of fraternity party. I don't even know what it was, uh -huh. but we show up to this, <laughs> this place and you know, it's like a platoon of seals and oh. all these people, all these girls are there. It's just wild. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember for a long time, for a long time when I was a young single guy, my favorite two cities in America were New Orleans and Lake Tahoe. Because Lake Tahoe, <laughs> Lake yeah, Tahoe yeah. is also just wild. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was I like said, that in the 50s too, huh? Oh, for sure. It uh, And, you know, we did, did all the French Quarter stuff. and mm -hmm. then, uh, and, and, But the fraternity parties were a big deal. And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty wild and crazy. I, I Although... I must say it was probably as much of a college experience as it was a city experience. Mm -hmm. But, but we would would spend time downtown in in the quarter and stuff. And usually, you know, if you're doing stuff and then you kind of finish up down in the quarter and somehow you get home. <laughs> uh, what are you studying when you're going to college? I studied uh, uh, psychology and then minored in English. And were you doing with that with any kind of intent, or is that just sort of like how it turned out? <laughs> oh, there was a lot of intent okay. because it looked to me like psychology was probably the easiest subject I could figure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then <clears throat> tangentially, I I started doing the English thing, and I minored in that, and then I I I, all, I became really interested in school. I read. A fair amount, and uh, and I remember graduating with a degree in psychology and minor in English. And I, I remember <clears throat> uh, as I th when I started thinking about it, I I really wished I'd majored in English and then you know, minored in something else. So psychology wasn't it wa it wasn't as uh, developed as a field of study as it as it is today to so many people it probably was but it just you just it just didn't reach down to the rest of the world uh as it seems to mm -hmm. now because my kids have studied it and boy they're 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 learning things that we didn't weren't even on the map you know when i was <laughs> going through but the english you know i kind of wanted to major in psychology partly just to learn about all the crazy people but <laughs> The when I was reading all these novels and books, uh, there that's, that's where the crazy, the crazy people. people were. <laughs> so I had plenty of that. So uh, so English was was good, and um, you know I, I'd say that I'd recommend that as a major for anybody. Yeah. But <clears throat> so as you're going through college, are you thinking you're going to get a job as a psychologist? Are you like what what are you thinking your future is going to be? Because you said you weren't really that interested in the military at that when, when you first oh, showed no, up. Oh no, no! The only reason in those days, uh, if you're a guy, a big part of your life uh, from about 16, 17 years old on is you got to deal with the draft. Because if you don't, if you don't deal, if you're not proactive with the military, you're going to get drafted and you're going to go in the army. Even in 1958. Yep. Yep. No kidding. Yep. And so I knew I had, you know, we had uh, ROTC kids in my fraternity, you know, and they'd do the ROTC deal. And uh, so, the, you know, there was a, I mean, there was an underlying con con concern or consider, yeah, the military was very much a part of your life if you're a guy. And so you're going to have to either be proactive, be going to ROTC or, or OCS if you wanted to be an officer or... Um, <clears throat> Or get married, and marriage was a was a kind of a ticket out of, of avoiding the military, mm. you know. And I think a lot of guys did that, uh, filled with regret, all of them. <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, you, you still think the military's tough. <laughs> Take a, how about a wife? <laughs> you know, so, the, so yeah, you gotta. I thought always cause thought that was a 
a bad choice not a, not not forever but when you're in your 17 18 19 20 year old you, you it's too early to sign up for that so you uh, so anyhow yeah i uh, i knew i had to do something about the military and i i remember talking to some guy who was a pilot navy pilot and i thought shoot maybe i'll be a pilot and then that article about udt came up and and uh, I remember this guy named King Mallory. He was thinking he's going to go into UDT, and we were we were on the swim team at Tulane. And oh, so you were like a legit good swimmer? Oh no! Yeah, yeah, again, like I say, God had a plan. We were just starting the swim team, so we we could take anybody. So <laughs> there, there I was uh, at Tulane, and I, we we did form the very first swim swim team that the Tulane had so we so I guess you made the team and I mean yeah well <laughs> besides because in order to travel you had to drive your own car and I had a car <laughs> so so we um, I made the swim team and what did this what did this Reader's Digest article say that really kind of stood out to you and I believe I believe correct me if I'm wrong I believe that Admiral Richards talked about the same thing wasn't Admiral Richards I think it was he also yeah. saw a Reader's Digest article and said it it's I mean people like my it's, it's everybody knows about that if, if you were in the teams uh, I, I I'm sure everybody has is aware of that article whether they read it or not I don't know but it, it yeah it is it was well known everybody so knew what did it. it say in there that that struck you as well one thing it really sounded like it wasn't very military you didn't have to be that organized you didn't have to shine your shoes you know you, know, you didn't have to do all that stuff which had a, a, appealed to me tremendously so uh and i remember one line in it and it um i didn't it said that I th- something like this: that uh, a, a frogman on the beach in his swim trunks with his uh, K bar in his hand uh, is one of the deadliest weapons in the military, or something like that. And and and, and that's really dramatic and Hook, everything. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> yeah, and and I I didn't exactly buy that but i like the spirit of it mm-hmm. and uh, i think as you in the passage that you read that there is a spirit of uh, you know what i'm 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 in the military i'm part of a group but i'm my own man i'm i'm I, i'm still who i am and i'm independent and your your loyalty your soul your loyalty to uh, what you really want to do it just it just so happens you're in this organization where everybody else feels the same way. And if you don't feel that way, you probably won't get through training. You know, mm-hmm. there'll be. So it was, it, 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 there was something, something rebellious about it. Here you are going in the military, but yet you're going in, you're kind of backing into it, man. He <laughs> says, I'll go in the military, but this is how I want to do it. <laughs> and I think, I think that was part of the, I think that was part of the psychology of it, of it that caused it. People, at least, it's, 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 that's what I liked about it. There was like a recruiting poster, a recruiting, yeah, some kind of poster that I think they had for Project Delta in Vietnam, and it was Charlie mm-hmm. Beckwith said something along the lines of, I promise you medals or a body bag or both volunteer here but i've also seen a similar thing for udts in world war ii i haven't been able to figure out the source of it but it was something along the lines of no kp duty no uniform no standing in line at the chow hall join the suicide squad udt (laughs) yeah (laughs) like a way to recruit guys man yeah Yeah. young young guys read that kind of stuff and they get all kinds of fired up for it sure (laughs) And uh, yeah, they have to have a, they, they have to want to take a risk too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what was the process for actually joining? How did your dad feel about you going in the UDT? Oh, he was salt for it, hundred percent in the game. Yeah, yeah. My dad was he was a great cheerleader, and uh, yeah, he we you know like swimming, you know, and he would 
he liked to drink a lot too and and boy <laughs> after a, you know it, we're at some cocktail party or something boy you know by the end of that night i he had me going to the olympics he had you know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was awesome <laughs> but but i i didn't measure up but it was it, it, yeah he, he he was all for it and did he re- did he tell you anything about the udts in world war ii he didn't know no, and uh, even when I joined, uh, he didn't. He probably didn't know what they much about him. He was in the Pacific, and uh, he was in an airplane, and I don't, you know, and I, I don't. I mean, the UDTs certainly were made a contribution during the war, but I don't know if everybody in the military was aware of what what all they did. Yeah. But I, he was stoked with uh, me jo- joining it. He, I think, he could see why. Um, why well, it appealed to me instead of you know something that's a little more organized, <laughs> and, uh, but it um, yeah he was he was all for it. I and, felt like he really was supportive of it. And then how did you get your commission? Did you go to OCS? Or, were you or were you in ROTC the whole time? Well, it, it's funny. I I, uh, I don't want to digress, anything, but I I really didn't know what what to do about the military up until uh, about the 10th of September. And I had I, I had a choice of either going six months in the Coast Guard and then three, you know, like six years of reserves, weekend duty, because uh, that was really the easiest way out. You just do Coast Guard. And then, then you do the reserves or go up to OCS. And I said, well, if it's OCS, uh, shit, it's the 10th of the I think they start the 15th. And I, so I, I was standing on the courthouse steps there and I just about flipped a coin as it came up OCS. So I said, well, fuck, I better get going here because <laughs> I'm driving in my 1957 Volkswagen. And so I made it. Uh, so that's how I ended up going to OCS. Where was OCS? Was it Rhode Island or was it? Yeah, there? in Newport. Yeah, and and when you showed up to OCS, is that was that run by Marine Corps drill instructors? No, they were Navy guys. guys. Oh, okay. oh, how I showed up! Just it's a good story because it shows you I didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> so I pulled in the parking lot. I had my clothes hung in the back seat of the uh, of my car, so that the Volkswagen window was my my blue my preppy blue blazer was up against the window and so i closed the car and i thought well i tell you what i i go I'll, I'll go i'll park here and i'll go and i'll check into my room and then i think i'll go into town and get a bite to eat well i go in there the next time i saw that car was about six weeks later <laughs> And uh, I wasn't going anywhere, man. <laughs> and so I, I welcome to the military. I said, sheesh, this is, I, I, now, I, now I know why I never wanted to go in the military. You, you can't do anything. So, so I get back out to my car, uh, my first day of liberty, after six weeks, and I was going to put my blue blazer on. However, that portion of the navy blue blazer that was up against the window had been exposed to the sun for six weeks, and it and navy blue blazers exposed to the sun it turns pink. So I had this <laughs> half my blazer was pink. So anyhow, that's how that's that was kind of my introduction when I realized that hey, you know what. Yeah, I'm not in charge of my life anymore. So that <laughs> was did, welcome to the military. Did you know you were going to UDT when you went to OCS? Was it some kind of contract? Was it like pre-designated, or did they just tell you you need to take a test or something when you got there? No, I I had no idea. I I I I, I didn't know it was an option, and I th- I think it it was not an option. Uh, at that point, and I think you had to do a year in the fleet, and then you could sign up for UDT. But that was, see, this was getting in towards uh, uh, 62, and I think whether we knew it or not, Vietnam was cooking up pretty good, and the, that's when Kennedy was president. And, and so the need for special warfare was was becoming more paramount at that point. And so during, actually it was during our class, uh, they opened it up, hey, if you wanna go directly into UDT from OCS, you may. 
So uh, I was on that like a tramp on a hot muffin. <laughs> I said, got to get there. So. so did you take a screening test or something? Or did you just you had a, uh You had a, uh, I think you had to hold your breath a certain length. And then there was another thing that you had to do. You had to go in a, was a, in a chamber and they pressurized you down to 60 feet or something like that. And I remember that um, because... I couldn't get my one of my ears to clear when I was down there, and uh, and it just I ended up bursting the eardrum. But I didn't tell anybody about it because I knew then it's, it's not one of those gray hogs out there is where I'd end up. <laughs> so I, uh, I I got through it, and uh, they let me in, and uh, and boy, I was really stoked to get you know to get to get a chance to. Go into UDT training. Was there even any? I'm I'm going to assume there was no UDT people at OCS. They must have been. Did they just look at you like you were a crazy guy for wanting yeah. to go to that? Yeah, I, I was the only guy, and I think I was the only guy in my class. That, I mean, even up until like the '80s, officers that were going to be SEALs were yeah. kind of like you were. You were capping your career, like oh, you'll make captain, but you're never going to be an admiral. You were just kind of, you were, you were. You were taking like a sideline. You were taking a side mm-hmm. job that didn't really count to the big navy. No, so I imagine in 1962 it must have been just. Oh like, yeah, that's a great point. You know, I, I rolled into Coronado. Uh, the high we had, there was UDT 12 and UDT 11 there, and then on the east coast there was 21 and 22, I believe. And then the highest ranking officer in on the west coast was a Mustang commander. And his name was Mac Boynton, and uh, he always smoked a pipe, so we called him Mac the Pipe. <laughs> and he uh, uh, he was and he was the highest ranking guy in the in the teams. And he was uh, I think second highest ranking person was a was a lieutenant lieutenant, and then he ended up becoming a lieutenant commander, and then uh, yeah, it was. It was bitching. I mean, it was just not. It was just, just like you, you just read about it, yeah. and uh, and it just it had it was. Uh, uh, when I was driving, and then when I was driving up Coronado, I got off the ferry boat, and I was driving up Coronado, and it was, the sun was going down. It was, and you was the br- the Coronado Bridge wasn't there yet? Not yet. So you're driving up the Strand? J- uh, no, you drive uh, into town, and you catch a ferry boat in, oh, in San okay. Diego. And had you had you driven your VW across country? Yeah. Would you have a VW Bug? Yeah, fifty seven. <laughs> 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 what color was it? Gold. <laughs> Call it the gold coach. So you drive uh, this yeah. thing across country. Did you do any preparation besides like, hey, you knew how to swim good? Did you run or anything like this? Yeah, they they said running was a big deal. And I remember as I drove, I would check in <clears throat> to a hot towel joint, and then I would run about two or three miles and then go to bed. And then um, I did that. And then when I woke up, I ran a couple miles and go to and, and then get going. Uh, yeah, I was. I, I knew you had to be a fit, and so I was working on that. And I had been since I left U- left uh, OCS. By the way, when I left OCS, I was li- in my gold coach. It, it was February and um, snowing, and I was driving through. I remember driving through Ohio, of all places, when John Glenn was going around the world or whatever he did, it, it, the epic – space flight that he did and it was i was just listening to it on my radio it riveted you know it's just fantastic and uh so that that's kind of how i got my start from ocs back to, was, over OC, to was ocs done in six weeks or is that just when you got your first break when the hell? uh it was done let me see i started in september so we yeah it was it was October November December January it was about a three or four month program, <clears throat> and uh, and so in February I was done I mean it was I I was commissioned and I was on my way to Coronado making that big Navy paycheck oh yeah <laughs> richest guy in the world yeah. oh yeah <laughs> driving one of the finest cars a modern day Tesla you know. It's just, <laughs> so you so you're driving out you drive out and you eventually get to Coronado. Yes. And you say you take the ferry from where? From downtown San Diego yep. into Coronado? Yeah, downtown what is that a seaport village? Yep. Is that, yep. Yeah, it is seaport yep. village now. 
you get off and you know you drive into NAB Coronado. You're looking right. at what what happens when you check in? Is anybody even there? Well, it, it, yeah, there was a Donald Laughlin that was the officer on duty, and then uh, this guy—I uh, forgot the name of the other guy that was working with him, but yeah, and he was again. I, I it was just also providential. I mean, Donald Laughlin was this great guy, he's very encouraging, and he said, "Hey, you know, it's he says it's it's hard, and, but you're going to do fine, you know." And yeah, a lot of, a lot of, and you know, yeah, I could have run into some guys and, oh man, you're going. But this guy, he was, he ended up being a good friend. And uh, was he? Good. So he was he in buds or he was already in the teams? He was already in the teams. He was one of the instructors, and he was the officer, uh, officer of the day, and so he was on the base when I checked in. And he was cool, really cool. Just like, oh, you'll you'll be fine. Yeah, man. That's cool. Yeah, it was really cool, you know. And uh, and I, I actually, as I think back on who was around in those days, and I, I think most of the guys on the teams would would have been, you know. <laughs> I wish I could say the same. I was talking to one of my buddies that's a master chief now on the teams. He's still in, but he said he was my roommate, buds. <laughs> he said when he checked in, he walked in the room. I looked up at him, <laughs> looked up at him, and said, "Quit now and avoid the rush." <laughs> 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 I'm like, I'm sorry, I was such an asshole. <laughs> um, oh <laughs> my god, his, that was his welcome aboard. We were laughing so hard that I said that to him. Uh, <laughs> freaking great guy. We had so many good times, yeah. but that was how I introduced myself to him. Why don't you quit now and avoid the rush? <laughs> That's really good. Good. How long did it take from when you checked into Buds to where you actually got into a class? That was good. It was about a month. Uh, we had some kind of course we took. They're just killing time mm-hmm. uh, at Building 401 across the street on the base. Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, UDT was in Building 208 on the, uh, the bay side of the amphib base. Okay. And then, and then the teams were where the teams were. Okay. So you have about a month and you're just kind of training, going through yeah. whatever kind of course they're putting through. You're working out. Yeah, you do you work out on your own, and uh, I, which was fine. I'd just get up and I'd run, run, I'd run quite a bit. Mm-hmm. The su- swimming, I I didn't think was going to be a problem, and uh, but the the running, you know, I wanted to make sure I could keep up on the run, so so I did that. Uh, you get this, and this is still called UDTR, right? At yeah, this UDT time, it's not called yet. Yeah, UDT R A. Yeah, so it's UD, U, it's the underwater demolition. Team's team. replacement or UD underwater demolition team training. Got it. And it's U D T R A. Yeah. And so, what class were you in? Twenty eight. So you're in class twenty eight. Was that a big deal back then? Did you guys make a big deal that you were in class twenty eight? Was it like you didn't weren't even thinking about it yet? I wasn't even thinking about it. I just wanted to get through the goddamn thing. <laughs> 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 Do you guys? Did you guys wear uh, helmet liners like like we like I did? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. did you put your number class number on it? I don't think we did that, mm-hmm. but we no. I'm sure we didn't. Mm-hmm. Class number wasn't wasn't a big thing yet. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. So you. Do you remember? Do you remember when you started? Do you remember your first day of first phase? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what See, was that like? They, they, they get. They heard so there were fourteen officers that were going to start class twenty eight. How many people total? And then there were about another eighty enlisted guys total in mm-hmm. the very beginning. But the first day of training, they do officers for two weeks. The officers had two weeks of training before the whole class comes Got together. It. And the reason was is that you had to get rid of the officers that are going to quit. And <laughs> and actually, we probably started with about twenty something, and we weeded out a number of officers right away, but not too many. Mm-hmm. I mean, so certainly the majority of of the officers remain in the class. But. A guy was telling me that um, like before Hell Week, they'll have you know a class and they'll be whatever seven yeah. officers ten yeah. officers yeah and the instructors will say who who's number one in charge and the you know guy raised this yeah this is before how they say who's next in charge and another guy who's next in charge and they'll go to like six deep <laughs> because the assumption is man you're gonna go through all those officers and they're gonna be gone <laughs> bye-bye <laughs> yeah, get a good look yeah, at them now man because yeah. they're 
they're going to be history. So they so the so the officers spent some time, two weeks. They're weeding out some of those guys, mm-hmm. and they weeded it down to how many officers? I think there were about eight of us. Okay. So, what were you guys doing when you were were they were they treating you like bud students? Were they beating you guys and tearing you up during those two weeks before you joined the class? I and mean, what were they doing to get rid of some of these guys? Well, the the runs were longer. It, it was all the physical stuff, mm-hmm. the, and then the, a lot of cold water. But it wasn't it wasn't that hard. Okay. It, it wasn't bad. <clears throat> the running was pretty pretty hard, and uh, I I worked pretty hard to get ready for it. And and I, I, I as I recall, I it it wasn't a real problem for me. But by gum, it was it was hard and. Uh, I remember, I think I was in sh- in shape for it, but uh, there's, I remember one, this one run we had, this guy, uh, in fact, he lives in Coronado t- today, he led the run, and she, you know, he just kept going and going, and, <laughs> and I remember at the end of the run, <clears throat> I guess I experienced hypothermia, which I'd never known anything about, and, and I still didn't at that time, but I know that as soon as, we got done with the run, and I ran over to the, I guess, the, someplace where they sold Baby Ruth candy bars, and they ate about two of those puppies <laughs> right off the bat and, uh, before we went to the chow hall. So. And uh, the, your instructors, were these guys like Korean War vets and World War II vets? That's a good good question. There was one guy that was a, a World War II guy, and I think I think he was at Normandy. And then there was uh, other guys that were Korean, and um, yeah, Korean War. I, and, oh, and Joe Barber, yeah, he he was a Second World War guy, but I don't know, he wasn't a frogman, I don't think, at that point. But uh, and then the other guys were were yeah, the couple of the other instructors were post uh, Korea. And this is 1962? 62. Uh, March of 62. Oh, so this is like the F- SEAL teams had just been formed they up. Did you hear just, about that? Yeah. they And so we went on across it. When we got done with training and went across the street, there were 50 SEALs. Uh, the SEAL Team 1 had been formed, and it consisted of 50 guys. So first day of – you said you remembered your first day of actual training mm-hmm. with the whole class. Mm-hmm. Did they – stomp you guys in the ground was it a more gentle entry what they do to you well we had a pretty serious conditioning hike um and so we uh, yeah there were, there were trainees strung out from the hotel to down to down to north you know just <laughs> everywhere but uh but yeah we had a good run and then we everybody's pretty hot so we got in the water it gets yeah, cooled off got cool you down <laughs> yeah. a little bit yeah <laughs> You trainees look look a little a little hot, and you need to get get cooled off here. So were people quitting on the first day? Yeah, yeah. We probably I don't know how many, but yeah, we'd lose the the first week there. We probably lost twenty guys mm-hmm. altogether. And it's a guess. I don't know. Do you think they just didn't know what they were getting into? I, I'm sure that a couple of them just didn't know that all. Yeah, because I know the I know nowadays there's so much uh, a, a prospective UDT guys gonna or SEAL team guys gonna they're gonna know a lot about they know the team. Yeah, and uh, but our guy, you know, in those days, yeah, there were there was um, yeah they didn't have any idea, and probably. Probably the there's one guy, he was from Holland, and he ended up graduating <laughs> from high school in up in the northwest someplace. And his name, he's a, he's a good friend of mine actually. He lives in Coronado now, and his name is Dutch uh, Swagemakers. And uh, and he, when we f- first day in the pool, he he could not swim, and uh, you know that deal where they. Have you have your? You have to keep your hands yeah. above water, or something like that. Yeah. And I don't know for how long it was, but it was. You know, you you need to keep yourself afloat. And this guy, 
he was a cyclist, so he had not one ounce of fat on him. So you put him on the in the pool, Sick couldn't the swim, rock. and yeah, he was down in the bottom, and he <laughs> he have his hands up there, and, he, and he's also he wasn't real tall. He's about five five six five seven, and he had his hands up there, and he you could tell he just and then he'd sink. The his fingers would go below the surface of the water, and then he he would get himself back up, but he made it through. And then when he, uh, and then all the swimming pool thing, and then finally, thank God, he was issued a pair of fins. And then with his legs as a cyclist, he, he could outswim most people anyhow. And so, but he, I, I'll never forget that guy. He's such a courageous guy and how he able was able to do what he did and with no swimming background at all <laughs> that's and, insane yeah it really is that's crazy yeah and he but he did it and he became he was a very successful frogman and then he uh he did some diving after the teams mm-hmm. and yeah but he's he's a local guy in coronado now and does has has a nice family and good wife and all that stuff so so you roll into Hell Week. Mm. What, what do you remember about Hell Week? Oh, it was it was bitching. It was, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, were you was what was the hype around going into it? Was people nervous? Were people excited about it? Were like were you scared? What was the hype going into it? I think nervous and scared probably was the two 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 biggest feelings about mm-hmm. it yeah everybody was and, and that's probably the same today huh you know it's just <clears throat> yeah it was uh, I know in my own head uh, you know I've thought about it a lot uh, I, I, I swear there was there was never a thought of not making it through hell week I just wasn't sure and I think that's how all of, all of us felt it, yeah, we're all going to make it, but we don't know how. But we weren't asked to articulate that. We all we had to do was hang in there, <laughs> and uh, and so that was my mindset. Well, what the hell? I'll just do it as long. I'll just hang in here. And uh, if you have that mindset, then I think it becomes manageable. And uh, <laughs> And it was it was hard. I mean, you got damn cold, and uh, you didn't sleep, and uh, but you knew after Monday that there's Tuesday, and you know we're just and we got done on Saturday morning, and um, and you got through, and uh, and it wasn't you didn't have this feeling that oh God I made it I can't believe I made it no you had this feeling well phew I'm glad that's over with. It, you, because I think you, I think your mindset uh, was that you're you're going to get through. Mm-hmm. It just, just how the hell you're going to do it? Who knows? You know. So you you just do it. How many how many people you think you lost? I don't know. Let's say we started with a grand total of eighty. We probably lost at least half. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe maybe we were down to thirty. <laughs> I remember we started with like six or seven boat crews, and then at the end we had four. And so you had six men in a boat. And mm-hmm. as, as I've said before, I wasn't much of a student, but I could multiply six. <laughs> yeah. Six on three. Yeah, I yeah, carry the one. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get so was was your training broken up into phases the way it is now? So for me, I went through first phase, which was like the weeding out phase, it was nine weeks long. Then we went into dive phase where you learned how to scuba dive and drager and all that, and then went into land warfare. I think dive phase was like seven weeks, and then land warfare was another eight weeks or nine weeks. It was it was somewhat like that, mm-hmm. yeah. It was definitely phase, that first phase right up to hell week, they just beat the crap out of mm-hmm. you, you know, or, and get in shape. Mm-hmm. And then you had hell week, and then I remember for a few days after hell week that next week we we did some we shot guns or something like that where we because everybody's pretty sore yeah, you're and beat so down. and then and then the dive phase and then um uh i guess was, was dive phase a challenge no uh for me for or, you no, not really no 
No, it was easy. Were you guys diving the old Emerson rig? What were you guys diving? Yeah, the Emerson. So you started on open circuit. Did you guys do right. pool competency? Yes. Oh, really? yeah. Yeah, they, we were well prepared, uh, I think. You know, everybody knew how to do it, and we were we, we were a lot in the – we were in the pool a lot, mm-hmm. and then we went off um, up at Point Loma a lot. It was pool comp. Like, when I went through, pool comp was a big uh, hurdle to get over where you had the twin 80s on. You had the yeah. double hose regulator. Yeah, right, They're going right. to come down, tie that thing in knots, rip your mask off, beat yeah. you up down there underwater. Yeah. It was something that a lot of guys failed. Myself included, I failed it the first time I took it. Um but it, was that like a big hurdle for you guys, or was it more like they were just instructing you? You know, I don't remember it being that that much harassment. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe we got off easy on that deal <laughs> because uh, there was a little bit of that, but for the most part, it was it was instructive, mm-hmm. and I never felt you know they made you take your regular you know do things and where you could hold your breath. But right. it, it was I don't remember that being a problem or a challenge even. And then you did. You said you dove the Emerson rig for a closed circuit. Do you remember? Oh, I remember. We dove a closed circuit thing, but I don't. I don't. Mm-hmm. I think I can't remember the name of it. it Might have been Emerson, mm-hmm. but it was closed circuit. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I remember some of the old guys told me they called it the Green Death because it was like a horrible rig to dive for whatever reason. I don't know the reason why they just they just didn't like this Emerson rig. Uh-huh. I th- well, I think I think that was it. I remember there was a guy in my this guy named Dowd who died in a training thing because mm-hmm. of the of the Emerson. I'm sure I think it was the Emerson, and I remember the poor guy. He was in the decompression chamber there trying to bring him back and didn't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the diving you said you were diving off Point Loma, yeah. going out doing basic dives and this right. kind of thing. Right. Uh, and then what? What kind of land warfare training did you get? Boy, that's a good question. I don't remember getting much of it at all. Uh, yeah, we didn't do. We did a little bit of marches out at Otai, where mm-hmm. I guess there are, there are a bunch of houses out there now. But <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it was a, a lot of land, you know, hiking and going around. But uh, there wasn't there wasn't much of it, and 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 it makes sense because SEAL Team was really just, wasn't part of the mission anymore uh, yet. Right. Uh, so that land stuff, it, we were water guys, mm-hmm. we were frogmen, mm-hmm. you know, so we you know <laughs> we didn't have to mess with that stuff. <laughs> so you w- w- when you wrap up with training, did you go to airborne school? Uh, I went about a year after training. Okay. Uh, some guys did, some guys didn't, and I don't know why my number was delayed but the, then we did go to jump school at, at Benning. So when you graduated BUDS or you graduated UDT training mm-hmm. and then you got stationed on a West Coast team, what team did you go to? 12. And what was it like showing up there? What was the what was the deal? <laughs> well, it was great. I ran into Donald Laughlin, the guy I met that very first day I uh, there and they uh, I think first thing we did is uh, uh, this a uh, fellow officer of mine and I he said, well, I guess kind of looked around and I said, well, might as well go for a run. So we we just started working out and and there wasn't a whole hell of a lot going on. Yeah. This and, is like uh, what? Now it's not, is it 1963 yet? Yeah. Or still no, 1962? Late, yeah, late 62, uh, August. We got done in August. Are you hearing rumblings about Vietnam? Is that like? A not th- really. Uh, I don't. I don't know if anybody had been to Vietnam yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even talking, I've had guys on that were, you know, in the Navy in 1965. Yeah. They still weren't thinking about Vietnam. It wasn't right. even a thing yet. In, right. As late as 1965, then it's kind of kicked off where everyone knew, That's just knew about exactly right, because I got out in 65, February of 65, and then um, my brother, uh, actually, I was driving east to go work in some – corporate job and uh and then he was driving west he just got done with ocs and he was heading heading to coronado so you guys high-fived as you crisscrossed yeah we we met in tucson drink Uh, we emptied that town of beer (laughs) and he went west and i went east and uh my wife was pissed off because i had drank too much the night before but then we we just uh 
carried on. And he had he had followed in your footsteps, heard about what you were doing, and, yeah. and thought that sounded like a good deal. Yeah, yeah. It, what what it, what are you tracking him as he's going through training UDT training? Pretty much, uh, he would send. I remember him. He got engaged, and uh, he got engaged while he was in training, and then got married after after he was done with training. But uh, yeah, and he would send pictures of of his engagement party and stuff. And I mean, he had his haircut like yours, and uh, and so it was uh, and yours, and so. Uh, they, um, uh, but you know, again, you know, we don't have the phone. Right, you know, right. the, it's just interesting how how infrequently we would communicate, and right. yet not always felt up to date. Right. But, I don't know. So when you got to just to rewind a little bit, when you mm-hmm. got to UDT, did you say UDT twelve? Yes. So you get to UDT twelve. Do you get assigned to a platoon? Do you go on deployment? What do you do when you get there? I got assigned to a platoon with a. Clay Freeman, he was a platoon officer, and uh, he was a great guy. Went to Dartmouth. He was a big time skier and uh, good good guy. But anyhow, so we and then uh, we just hung out, and I think we did some. We did a sub op one time off of uh, San Clemente, and mm-hmm. and then um, oh, and and then what what did happen is that we had the the missile crisis with Castro okay. deal, or yeah. And that, that ended up not being anything really, but they everybody loaded up on a uh, APD. I think is, it, is that what we traveled in, and then uh, they just did PT, and they got down to the canal, and then turned around and came back because uh, the crisis was over. Also, like you loaded up on a ship to go over to Cuba for yeah, to right. do whatever. To, right, 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 and and not having it to do it then came home would you would you guys go on deployments you know like when i got in the teams you were going to get in a platoon you're going to do a workup you're going to go on deployment you're going to get done with that deployment and right. the first couple deploy well actually the first uh second third and fifth deployment i think were all shipboard for me okay so i was on ships oh is that right were okay. you guys deploying like that or we when you got put in your platoon, did you say? Did someone say, "Okay, on this date, you're going to go on deployment. You're going to go to the South Pacific, or you're going to go to Southeast Asia on a ship, or anything like that?" Well, um, uh, not that organized. We would get assigned, and we knew that our platoon was going to go at such and such a time. You know, I think uh, I think we were due to go out another six months after we got on them, and then um, and you'd go. And I forgot how long the deployments were, mm-hmm. but they were seemed pretty pretty long. So, did you do one of those deployments? And well, <laughs> we keep talking about God intervening here. Uh, what what happened to me <laughs> is um, uh, a, a, we we got a new CO took took Mac the pipes position. <laughs> But this new CO is a guy who was a Naval Academy grad, and uh, he was coming to the team. He said, you know, and he said, "God, a Naval Academy guy going to run McHale's Navy? Are you kidding me?" <laughs> and so Bill Robinson shows up, and uh, he took one look at me for some reason, and uh, he said. I don't know how, I don't know if you're going to do very well on the teams. I say, okay. He says, yeah, but first thing, you need a haircut, you know. Because I was really taking this role that they described <laughs> in this thing seriously. <laughs> but being a Naval Academy grad, he couldn't exactly embrace the same same thing that, that I was embracing. And so he says, I'll tell you what, I'm good friends with Jack Suddeth. And Jack Suddeth was the head of the training department. He says, I'm going to see if I can get you a job over there. I said, whew, talk about the briar patch. Yeah, I mean, that's a hell of a deal. Yeah, you get me into the training department, I'm I'm fine. The training department at UDT? Yeah. Okay. At Building 208. And so... But this wasn't the the training department that ran uh, basic training. This is like, oh, it is. Yeah, it was... So you were going to be like a a UDT instructor? UDT instructor. And how long have you been at the team for? 
Well, that was in December. I got in in August, so what? September, October, November. I was in th- three months. And this guy looks at you and says, you're probably going to be better off as an instructor? Yeah. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> and I was all for it. And uh, so I went over in the in the training training unit, and, um, and I, I just loved it. It was a guy. I mean, who? The being an instructor is a great deal. And, uh, you know, I was qualified. I mean, I could run. I could do all that stuff, you know, and I knew everything about uh, what – what trainees go through but i had no i i did not deploy i didn't you know i did we did a couple practice runs but i but bill felt that it was better for the overall organization if i was there (laughs) and not with him and uh so i i was there so i finished out my my naval career there and then uh how many years were you instructor for two and a half years and you put through how many classes? Like 10, 15 well, classes? Well, it was uh, 30, 31, 32, uh, 33, well, 30, class 30, 31, 32, 33, and start of 34. Because my brother was in class 35. And then um, we, uh, yeah, and he, you know, I, I was out by the time Danny started, my brother. What uh, What did you learn about? humans and and their ability to push through when you were an instructor as compared to when you were going through it yourself um, I never was an instructor mm-hmm. and so I never got to see kind of the other side of it mm-hmm. but I've you know obviously got a bunch of friends that were instructors and it was interesting sure. some of the takeaways that they would have from watching people go through these extremely stressful scenarios you know that's a good that's a good point and uh, and a good question and there's probably a lot about that that's that's profound and and would be instructive and I I think I just uh, the way I operated it was probably just on my gut you know and I'd see guys come into training and and you could tell <clears throat> gee is this this guy's gonna make it or not and it was. It was great watching them, the ones that are determined and that are really, it's like probably like being a coach, you know. It's like I, I know my son played water polo and, the, you know, and the coach is, a good coach is, assesses his his players, you know, really well and thoughtfully. And uh, I think, I think you could, I think probably what I remember thinking that about I can't think of any specific case, but I remember kind of making a, a judgment based on what I saw uh, of their performance, you know, in, in the training. So I, 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 that's about, and I couldn't, I don't guess I had, I could differentiate the ones that could make it and mm-hmm. not, I mean, between the ones that could make it and not, I could differentiate between them, but then you have a group of, of trainees that, that got through and you know other than the common deal that they were determined and focused and worked hard and committed it seems strange uh that they're really over all these years they've never been able to figure out who's going to make it and who's not going to make it it doesn't matter if yeah. you were a, a division one wrestler or a division right. one water polo player you might quit and you and you might make it, and right. you could be a you know person that like doesn't know how to swim, like your buddy yeah, there. Like and, Dutch, and yeah. You'd think never in a million of years this person can make, and they can make it. Yep. They've just not really figured it out. <laughs> right. They haven't really figured out who's going to make it and who's not going to make it. Right. Well, you know, it just reminds me there was a guy, an officer in my class, um, when we were doing the uh, the two week pre officer deal, and uh, he was a, an Olympic swimmer. He's a backstroker, and he went to Yale. Um, God, I, I, I haven't thought about him until this moment, but uh, he he was in my class. And I remember this other guy uh, in my class who was a swimmer at Dartmouth, and he was you know he knew all about good swimmers, and he swam against this guy. And he says, "Yeah, well, yeah, he's he was in the Olympics." You know, and he said, "Oh my God, yeah." And I remember him, and he quit after two days. <laughs> you know, he couldn't run. Uh, he could swim. They're going to figure out what you're weak at, aren't they? 
Yeah, aren't and, they though? And, and yeah, it's gonna. Yeah, you have, you have to be. You have to be. I was kind of lucky that I was. I I was okay at kind of everything. I wasn't gonna win anything. I never. I never want to. I don't think I ever want to run my entire time in the SEAL teams. I don't think I ever want to. Well, in fact, I can know I never want to swim. But I was kind of like okay at pretty much everything, and Perfect. that is a better way to be than to be an Olympic swimmer. Oh, and yeah. not be able to run. <laughs> yeah, you betcha. <laughs> that, you, that doesn't that doesn't work. I think this guy's name was Dolby. I have to look him up. But uh, yeah, I remember. Gosh, he was poor guy. He just wasn't built for running mm-hmm. and all the land stuff. It was, t- and if he, it's a good thing he never had got to the obstacle course because he probably would have died. But <laughs> but <laughs> boy, he was great in the water though. <laughs> so you spend these two and a half years. Uh, putting students through, uh-huh. seeing that side of things. And then it's just your time is up in the Navy. Yep. And you decide you're gonna you decide you're gonna move on. I had to go get a job. <laughs> and uh, see my heritage a lot of a lot of the way I was formed uh, growing up was the the whole boarding school, the corporate deal. My dad was a corporate guy and and that's naturally what I'm gonna be doing. And then when I got in UDT uh, I realized that's not how I have to live my life. and But I signed up for a corporate job anyway, and I was in this management training program back in Baltimore, Maryland. And I love the The company's wonderful. It's this McCormick and Company. They sell spices, and the people, the nicest bunch of people I've met in any group. And uh, and they were, God, they were so great to me and everything, getting started. But I realized... Um, I remember my first day of work, I was up on the sixth floor of this building, and I spent the whole day in there, and as I, it was, it was real sunny and bright when my wife dropped me off at work, and then at night when I come down, it was about six, and it was still, it was summertime, so it was still light, and I could tell it had rained during the day, and I said, what's this all about? It rained while I was in this building, and I wasn't even aware of it, and I said, this is this is not how I want to live. I don't want to live in a in an office. So then I I stuck with the training program for a couple of years, and then uh, I I had to make a move, so I did. But I, and I ended up um, a, a friend of mine was teaching school at Punahou School in Ho- in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. So I uh, I said. So I wrote him. I said, "You got any you got any openings out there?" So he got me a job as a teacher at Punahou and I said boy from Baltimore to Honolulu that's not a bad switch so. uh, you're tracking your brother as he goes through mm-hmm. training mm-hmm. and you know he's he's doing good makes doing it good. through training yep um, what is he is he writing you letters how are you is he calling you on the phone how are you how are you tracking like like you said we don't have uh, I, cell phones in our pockets I back think, then. I th- you're right, right. No, it's much different, of course. But I think phone calls, uh, we would call long distance and it would always cost a whole bunch of money to, to to call long distance in those days. But it wasn't that onerous and we could, we could, we could, we could, we knew what was going on. And, and as that's happening and now, now he's in the teams, now Vietnam is sort of in you know escalating very yeah. rapidly yeah and is he talking to you about the fact that he's probably gonna end up deploying to vietnam no he was planning on going into the training unit just like i did uh and th- thought thought for sure that that would happen but then and he did did one deployment in vietnam and then came back and, th- and that was at a udt deployment yes he so was he with did, 12 okay. uh, no he was with team 11 so he does a udt deployment to mm-hmm. vietnam Mm-hmm. And they're doing the kind of UDT stuff, yeah. working yeah. a little bit, but it wasn't really. Well, I shouldn't say that because I've talked to a bunch of UDT guys that did some really dangerous stuff in in yeah. Vietnam. Um, oh, there was they were doing ambushes and stuff. Okay. They, were, they were playing with guns mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was, it was different. And he, and he came home. And what was his what were his thoughts about that deployment? What did he tell you about that? Uh, well, he. He he just thought that he he wasn't sure how how much he 
how purposeful it seemed to him. I mean, he wasn't rebellious. He was going along with the program and happy to be a part of the team and, and all of that. But he, it wasn't – He was just. it was just something he had to do. He's glad he did it and got it done. But then uh, the whole the whole Vietnam spirit is, is pretty – pretty grim even with the teams even with great people like UDT guys and uh, it just no one really knew what they were doing and they'll tell you gosh we went over there and we didn't we weren't really sure what was going on and then um, he did tell me like this one instance they were setting up they had an ambush all set up and then some VC come down and on in the river and they uh and Danny, Danny said that he had his gun up ready, and he was ready to let it rip. And then he felt this tap on his shoulder, and there was this enlisted uh, doc. I forgot his last name, but he was a medic guy. And uh, and he said he shook him off, and so Danny kind of lowered his weapon, and uh, and then next thing you know, there's a whole boatload of them coming down, and he, he, somehow the doc was aware Danny wasn't but the doc said hey this is, we don't we don't want to play guns here just now we're, we're outnumbered and sure enough um, they got through the, but there was a it was that kind of thing that was going on in Vietnam you know, no one ever really knew what was what was happening and um, he um, so he gets back and then he was hoping that his next deal would be to get uh, get assigned to uh, the training unit. And um, but instead he got he got assigned to SEAL Team One. And uh, they were heading out. They were going to deploy to Vietnam, you know, shortly. And I remember this friend of ours, Lou. He was an officer in the teams, and because uh, Danny was married, and Lou said, "Hey." Uh, and Danny was pissed because he wanted to go to the training unit, you know. And so, um, but he, he's fine with it. He, he's, that's what I'm going to do. And so Lou said, hey, you know, he's a single guy. And he said, you know, let, let me take your place. I'll take your place and I'll, I'll go in the teams and you can go to the training unit. Because Lou was in the training unit already. And uh, Danny said, no, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see this through, you know. So he did. And um, and so it's just kind of the thing it works out. But <laughs> and then so so he goes on to deployment in Vietnam. Did you hear from him while he was over there? Not from him. <laughs> but but uh, he was over there for about a week, and I got a phone call from. Uh, his uh, from the CO of SEAL Team One, who was F- Frank uh, Anderson, and he said that. He said that. Uh, he said that uh, Danny was killed. And I, uh, so that's the last I heard, the first and the last I heard of that deployment. And uh, I was in Baltimore at the time. Did that uh, make the cubicle you were sitting in all day seem even smaller? Well, I had pretty much committed to uh, moving out of that cubicle anyhow, so that in in and of itself wasn't wasn't a problem. But it did did raise the you know, and then, of course, my parents uh, were devastated and stuff as as were the parents of 50,000 other people. and uh, But it did, 
and then uh, that was in April, and so in August I would I would be coming back out for the. Uh, we all you had to go two weeks of uh, training because um, of the reserve. Oh, so commitment. you were still in the reserves. I was still in the reserves, so I I was destined to come back to Coronado and do that in August, and uh, so, um, but I knew. I knew then I probably would figure out a way to do something else. I actually, during that two-week deal, I found out about Ponaho and and I already made a plan to get out of the cubicle. But um, but going to uh, but it did raise the question <clears throat> of uh, should I go back in? And because Frank asked, he says he says. He didn't ask me to come back in, but he said that uh, I, I brought it, I kind of mentioned it to him. He says, well, boy, if you want to come back, I'd love to have you, you know, because we got along well. And actually, Bill Robinson, the guy that sent me to the training, and we ended up becoming real close friends. But um, but uh, but Frank says, well, yeah, 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 if you, we could use, we need, we need people, and we'd love to have you back. I said, "Well, I'll, th- I'll think about it." And um, it was a, I was wrestling with that for a few months, and then um, <clears throat> we got done with one of those. Uh, during those two weeks, we got a lot of briefings from guys that were in Vietnam, and they would uh, tell us what was going on. And uh, usually, we were, and so we'd get we'd listen to those and. And I remember we were out uh, in, in a break during those briefings, and I was we were out kind of smoking cigarettes and just kind of hanging out and taking a break. And and Tom Terusi, who had just got back from Vietnam, <clears throat> uh, and I were talking. He he he. I put him through training, and we were good friends. And so I I mentioned during the deal that. <clears throat> I was thinking of going back in, and uh, and he looked at me and he says, shook his head. He says, "It's all bullshit. The Vietnam's all bullshit." He says, "You you don't want to go back in," and uh, and f- for some reason, or I think. I think he was right about Vietnam. I mean, I think everybody realized that that was that was a mistake, a horrible mistake, and a lot of a lot of people. It it cost the country a, a lot, and um, and it cost a lot of families a lot. So I I, <clears throat> I I my personal decision was, you know, I probably another month I decided that no, it's. Mm-hmm. It's not the right thing to do. I, I, uh, I, I, I guess I thought of my parents. I thought it, I, I just, I just thought about the whole Vietnam thing. I guess, and uh, and I'm not sure exactly what caused me to come to that, come to that decision. But uh, it, it just. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be the right thing to do. Yeah, I can't even imagine trying to, you know, you trying to tell your parents that you were going to make that decision. That doesn't seem like that would have uh, been 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 the right thing to do in that scenario. Hey, who knows? Mm-hmm. You know, I uh, I didn't. <clears throat> it never really got that far, so I didn't have to really hurt my head over it. Uh, but I, it's a decision I made. Mm-hmm. Do you stay in the reserves, though? Yes. Uh, well, you you were obligated to. Um, so I stayed in for about seven more years, and then then got out. But it was I was more into <clears throat> living in Hawaii and teaching school and and getting getting getting. Get, oh, and kids were showing up. <laughs> <laughs> showing up. Yeah. When did you start surfing? I was a ripe old age of 22 in Coronado when I first got to Coronado. And uh, they, uh, you know, like I said, when I first pulled in there and those cars with the boards hanging out and everything were, 
God, it's just such so compelling. So I signed up, and uh, I bought a board, bought a Hobie, uh, Phil Edwards model in uh, Dana Point, and drove up there and got it and started surfing. Was that before Dana Point? Was they put all the? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Was it was it as good as like Malibu? How good was it? It it usually was bigger. Yeah, it was as good as Malibu, and it was a huge and it was usually a a big swell. Uh, North Swell, and then it was, yeah, it was it was killer Dana. So uh, that was, must have hurt uh, being in Baltimore as well. Now you can't yeah. surf. <laughs> yeah, although I did go to Rehoboth Beach. Okay. Floor. Yeah, yeah, we did went there a couple of times. And, uh, yeah, but I, it really had to get back to California. It was really important. <laughs> and then you end up in Hawaii. You're teaching school, mm-hmm. and are and and you're just getting more and more, or I should say, I guess, continuing to find other ways to be involved in the water at this time. Yes, and then uh, it was, <clears throat> I got really interested in outrigger canoe racing, and um, and so I joined this canoe club, and there was one other guy there that was a holly guy, and the rest were uh, low coin, and uh, we we got on a crew and. Uh, I loved it and became real good friends with the coach, his uh, baby Bell, and he uh, he, he he was great. It's, how how long are those races? Well, the uh, you have the regattas, and so if you're like I was senior man, and those are about a mile, and you have buoys, you go mm-hmm. around and around, and then uh, then you have the distance races after the regatta season is over, and then you have the distance races. You know, there's one that runs from. Um, Kailua to uh, uh, Waikiki, 20-something. And then the granddaddy of all the canoe races is the Molokai race, which goes from Haleolono Harbor and on on Molokai to uh, Waikiki. And so... Uh, and how big... Well, this is... Uh, how many people are in the canoe? Six. And then, like, when you do those long-distance races, you have nine, nine people in the canoe. And... Uh, <clears throat> You three are resting, and then you just change and you make water changes as you go, and you change every 20 minutes or so. And it's about a six hour race, <sighs> so it's it's you it's you, you have to be in pretty good shape, but mm-hmm. it's but you do, you know, you just get in and shape. how'd you do in all those races? Well, the first year, we uh, Let me see. I guess our first year we were really bummed. Yeah, we we got beat by Waikiki Surf and Outrigger. We were third, and then the next year <clears throat> we we won it, and then the next year after that we won it, and then uh, and then the th- my last year um, I was up on the mainland starting to work for Chart House, but I, they. They said I could come back and paddle with them in the Molokai race, so I went back and we we did pretty well, but we didn't win it. But it was it was a good race. And is that what your transition was out of uh, teaching school, going to work at the Chart House? It was. Yeah, yeah, I was teaching. I was working on. I was waiting on tables in Waikiki uh, while I was teaching school. I worked at Chuck's Steakhouse. Uh, it was at the Outrigger Hotel, and Buzz's Steak and Lobster it was down on Beach Beach Walk. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I I I knew I, I knew I wanted to go to work for for the Chart House because there were a couple of UDT guys that were actually there was one UDT guy and then Joey Cabell who's a big time surfer that started the very first Chart House in Aspen, mm-hmm. and his name is Buzzy Bent. And then Buzzy and Ron Smith were classmates in UDT class sixteen is 16 or 19 but it was before me and i became friends with ron who's a dynamic character and just a great personality and and he was at this point in the late 60s he was um president of chart house and then buzzy was kind of retired and uh john was uh ron was running the company and that's I, so I wrote him a letter. I said, hey, I'm working at a steakhouse in Waikiki. You got any openings? And he says, sure, yeah, come on. So I ended up working for the chart house. And wh- what did you do at the chart house? So there was a chart house in Coronado when I was when I was in Buds and when I right. got to SEAL Team 1. And, right. man, I used to go to that chart house, I don't know, like 
once a week, maybe yeah. once every other week, and get prime rib. And it was weird because when I grew up, we didn't eat a lot of steak when I was growing up, so I yeah. didn't even start liking steak and mm. and prime rib until I was like uh, in the Navy because then I could mm. buy it myself. Yeah. yeah. But we used to go. I used to go to the chart house with my buddies, and but we and I knew. Like there was some, I had some knowledge that this was some kind of team guys that owned this thing, yeah. but I never made any connections with every, anybody, never like, n- never talked to anybody, no one ever said anything about it. Mm-hmm. But w- so were you involved in that chart house in the early 90s in, in Coronado? Well, I even before that, I started in 71. Oh, damn. The and chart house has been around since the 70s? Yeah, I think they did the, oh yeah, the first one in Aspen was uh, uh, 19... 19- 60, I think. It opened on July July 4th. And then the second one was in Newport. And that was, I remember I was in the Navy when we ate it at the Newport one. And then uh, that was the second one. And the third one was uh, at at Shelter Island. Okay. Yeah, on Shelter Island. Okay. And that's when Ron joined the company. And... um, yeah, he got out of the Navy about 64, 65, and then went to work because of Buzzy. He and Buzzy were tight. And, and this is um, someone you said named Buzzy Bent? Yeah. Not Buzzy Trent, the Right, the no, surfer. the surf guy. Yeah, no, no, it was Buzzy Bent. It was a great surfer himself. And so you were working as a waiter in Hawaii. Right. And you write these guys a letter, they're old team guys, you're an old team guy, yeah. and they're like, yeah, we'll hire you. Yeah. Did you tell me you were a waiter, or did you tell me you had some big management position? <laughs> no, 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 I told them that I was a waiter. I was a, and uh, and I, well, I, knew, I knew Ron fairly well at this point, personally, you know, and so he, he, he believed me, you know, that I, that, and so I, we had kind of a training program. This was in 71 when I came, I came back. I came back from Honolulu to uh, to Redondo Beach mm-hmm. and uh, did a training program there for a few months, and then uh, then they Ron and actually John Creed, the other guy who's the executive vice president, he was an old surf guy and and water guy, and they said they were talking about gee, we'd like to get a a a restaurant, a chart house in Hawaii, because, uh, and there was one there, but it wasn't part of the corporate chart house mm-hmm. on the mainland. So I said, well, gosh, you ought to, you ought to buy a, a restaurant from Jerry McDonald. He has them on Maui. And so we ended up, so uh, the, we ended up buying the Sugar Cane Inn, which is in Lahaina, and then made a chart house out of that. And that was my first real assignment with chart house is to go open that, build it, get it ready f- for business. And that was my first as- kind of real assignment. And what, after my year, what year was that? That was in 1972 is when we, because Danny was born in November of 72. Uh, we went over in December of 72 and bought the chart house. And, and then we've, Stay there. I, I, actually, I, I have to. I, I got to acknowledge the heroic wife I had at that point. She <laughs> gave birth to Danny on November eleventh, nineteen seventy-two, and uh, December tenth or eleventh, we were uh, on Maui. Uh, she, she with a month-old child, month after giving birth, and we were opening a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, uh, she courageously charged through it and did great uh probably no one else could do do that (laughs) and uh so how long how long were you running that chart house i ran ran that baby for about a year and then um i came back to the let me see i had a oh yeah and i came back to um the mainland, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. We, I ran that for about a year, and then uh, about that time, Chart House was getting bought by another, uh, by another corporation. It was a big, it was the largest franchisee of Burger King restaurant. So they, they wanted to diversify, and so they bought the Chart House. At that point, consisted of about seven or eight restaurants, and um, at that point, uh, so they, 
asked me to come back for that to be a kind of a regional manager guy in California. So we, we moved back. And uh, I, again, it was almost the same sort of experience I had in Baltimore. I said, this is getting pretty corporate, guys. And so uh, how about, <laughs> can I go back to Maui? And uh, so I went back to Maui and we stayed there for quite a while. Still with the chart house. I, still with the chart house. Yeah, I went back there and then we, uh, I ran the chart house that I had opened a year earlier as a manager. So, I, and then we started developing restaurants in the islands, and uh, and I, then I became kind of a regional guy out there. Then, and how long did you stick it out in in that business? I stuck it out. Uh, I was there. Let me see. So seventy. Because oh. the restaurant business is really hard. Well, it. <laughs> It, it is, it's, although as many of us from Chart House like to say, is that, yeah, I wouldn't work for a restaurant company unless it was a Chart House. I mean, Chart House was pretty, well, as you, you just described it. Yeah. It's, it's a special place, and it was. And, uh, and to, in fact, today, even though Chart House is no longer in existence, um, there's a kind of a f- Facebook group that has uh, the... Um, it's the old old chart house employees, friends, and so on. Oh, wow. And they're boy, they're just it's a it's a great group. They're very dedicated to uh-huh. the chart house. And he's like, I remember this when this happened, and somebody <laughs> fell in their face in the avocado dip, and you, <laughs> it's just so. There's a lot of history there that gets retold in in Facebook form. So, but <laughs> well, how long did you stick with it then? And then, well, I stuck with it. Uh, until about 76, and then I built a, my own restaurant up in Makawao, and uh, I just made it, I just ripped the chart house off. We had a salad <laughs> bar, and, you know, and we had our deal, and, and, but it, it, it took off. It was a great restaurant, very, very busy. And, um, and so we ran that for a while. We were living in Lahaina, and it was about a 45-minute drive up to Makawao, and it was, I wasn't, I was kind of getting tired of that, so... I asked the chart house guys if they wanted to sell any chart houses. So I ended up buying another chart house right outside of Boston in Duxbury, Massachusetts. And again, my courageous wife, who was pregnant with our youngest child, uh, and uh, we loaded up and went there, ran that restaurant for about a year, and then, um, and then the, our our. Our, our little baby Dougie was born there, and then we, uh, um, and then Chart House, they they ended up buying that restaurant back from me, and then offered me a job back with the company in California because they were going to do a leverage buyout from Pillsbury. By this time, Pillsbury owned the hmm. owned the Chart House, and and they were going to do a leverage buyout. So the, he asked me to come on back and help help with that so where'd you go where'd you move back to coronado back to coronado and yeah. what year was that it's 85 and you now you're now you're still working with chart house yeah are you having to go to the restaurants every day i mean what are you doing well i was a regional manager guy and then um uh, oh i was in their training department for a while and then i was a regional manager guy and i my region uh, I was living in Coronado. My, my region was in Hawaii and Colorado. And so I had three fairly nice places. I was going to say rough, go. yeah, rough yeah. tours. Rough, rough tour. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how long did you stick with that for? That up until the uh, time Sam Zell bought the chart house, which was in 98 or something like that. And Sam Zell, he's a huge real estate guy. I think Chicago. he's isn't he the biggest uh, real estate owner in the world or something like something that? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, it was, I was talking with an accountant that knew him in Chicago, and uh, she said that the saying in Chicago is that if Sam jumps out of a 20-story building, you ought to jump after him because he's probably going to make money on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, he... Um, yeah, and so I did, did. I stuck with that until 90, 98, and then um, I moved back to Coronado, uh, 
And then we, uh, oh, and then Danny, my other boy, said that, well, why don't you come, why don't you be a lifeguard? And I said, geez, really? Okay. So so was he a lifeguard at this time? Yeah, he was at North Island. We were. And how uh, old are you at this point? I was, uh, I was about to turn, was it? 50 or 60, I was about to turn, <laughs> turn to 60. And he's telling you you should, you should become a lifeguard. Yeah, right? and so we, I went through a lifeguard training. So this whole time, are you just in the water still and you're still working out? Are you still training? Like, how are you staying? In, I'm thinking about going to the lifeguard academy at age 55 or 60 or 50, yeah, whatever, even 40, whatever. Whatever it was, I'm not sure. I think I went through and. 99, so I guess that's 60. Is that 60? Yeah, yeah that's 60. Yeah. yeah, so you're 60 years old going through the lifeguard academy. Well, I think I was a couple of years younger. So I was in my late 50s, though. Okay, and how are you staying in shape all this time? Oh, I worked out. So you I, work out every day re- re- religiously? Yeah. I, I Even now, as, and I'm about as decrepit as you can get, but I, <laughs> I, I do something. And uh, it's an embarrassment. You know, people laugh at me as I go down the beach and everything, but that's tough. Now, how about what you're eating when you're working at all these restaurants? You got free access to yeah. like all kinds of food all day and night. How are you not just powering into you know those that freaking hot brown bread that they used yeah, to have at the yeah, right, house? Right, How right. are you not freaking putting on like eighty pounds of excess fat from that? Well, I think that's really my motive for working out is that <laughs> hey, if you work out hard enough, you can eat anything you want. <laughs> and uh, I say, in order to keep my eating lifestyle functioning and uh, flourishing, then I, I work out. And uh, but lately, you know, I've got these children that are Nazis about food. <laughs> I, can't, I can't eat this. I can't eat that. I mean, so I'm I'm a little more disciplined. <laughs> so you're how many how many hours a day would you say you worked out? Like when you were, let's just say you're 40 years old. You're working at the chart house. How many hours a day are you working out? Are you going for a for an hour run, two hour run? You doing PT on the beach? What are you doing? Well, we got into cyclling too. Oh, okay, and. Uh, Cyclists, yeah, they're really crazy, and so I got a little bit of fringe craziness out of that. And we would <laughs> we, we would ride. Well, like my daughter and I did a, we got a tandem bike, and we rode from Aspen, Colorado to Taos, New Mexico, which is about two two hundred fifty miles, and then and then we rode from there to. Well, we drove down to Albuquerque, and then we rode from Albuquerque back to San Diego, and she she was right there with me, and uh, we did a I don't know hundred and something a day, something like that. For but uh, th- those were that's more long. I, I I think I think the probably the probably the most important thing for me is is the consistency of, mm-hmm. uh, of working out, and I have a friend. Um, he he says, motion is lotion, and guy, you know that really. You, if you keep moving, you're going to be all right, you know. And and it's like this morning, I hadn't been in in the water for a few weeks, and uh, when I went to bed last night, I said, "You're you're in Coronado. The first thing you do tomorrow is you get on your paddleboard and you go for a paddle." Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and paddling is important for me because, like I said, I'm. I'm pretty decrepit and kind of a physical disgrace, but uh, I can still paddle, I hope. And uh, we're going to find out tomorrow morning. So that I did go for a paddle this morning for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And then I intend to lengthen that out. But I spend some time in Taos, and the problem there is that the paddling isn't i mean it can be done but you have to go down to the rio grande river mm-hmm. which is which i'm happy to do but i in the winter it's a little nippy you know so um but when i go back i'll probably go back next week and but i'm gonna get get to paddling because i got in the boy my first couple strokes off on my board this morning it was like the tin man and Oz, <laughs> man you couldn't jeez so we you know <laughs> You could hear the sirens going off. <laughs> People call nine one one. This geezer, yeah, this geezer. He just pulled away from the dock, and I don't think he's gonna make it. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> the, the miracle of paddling is, by gum, after about fifteen or twenty minutes, the pains that I was feeling with those first couple strokes, 
I didn't feel them anymore. And, you know, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to pick it up here a little bit. And, gee, by the end of it, I felt like I, I felt fine, you know, so. That's the motion I, is the, the lotion, I guess. Exactly. So how, so you, you end up going through the Lifeguard Academy. Yep. And you bu- you actually become a lifeguard? Oh, this yeah. becomes your job? Well, was, you know what? I, I realized uh, I was kind of, I had about 10 years in with uh, North Island. And then uh, I got fired because this lady took over the all the lifeguards. And she found out that we were drinking beer in the tower at 3. And I, I wasn't with them, but... Some of these young fellows were a little <laughs> less disciplined and got busted, and so I, I, I was part of that great um, heli, and got uh, so anyhow, I ended up So not, you got fired as a lifeguard. You, now you're what? You were like 60 years old, 60-something uh, years old? For being a miscreant drinking beer on the job, well, I was getting yeah, I was getting in the, in my sixties. I and I wasn't, I wasn't even part of the fire. What, they I just did. fired everybody. Well, she fired that group, and then I was up was in New Mexico or something, and I came back and I wanted my job back, and she just wouldn't give it back to me. So I, I guess I didn't actually get fired, but I sure didn't get a rehire. <laughs> so then Coronado, uh, I don't know. if it was Sean Carey, who's the captain down there, is a one, wonderful human being, and he said, he says, uh, he says, well, I, you know, he, he, well, Dougie and I tried out that same, that same, te- yeah, we both would decide, yeah, we, I, it's one. It so was you a, and your youngest son try out for the lifeguards at the same yeah, time. Yeah, were, were we, uh, was that the summer before you got married? Um. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Anyhow, he and I go down. Oh, yeah, that was it. And there were eight of us that were going, <laughs> that were going to be applying to be a lifeguard shop. And so this guy, the, the guy that was running the, the PT stuff that we had to do in order to qualify, uh, he, he had us all up. And, and the first thing was a swim, I think, out to the buoy and back. And then we had to run up the beach to the other end of the beach, you know, 150 yards or something like that and then there were a couple of little deals like that and uh i remember there were eight of us and half of them were girls and uh dougie was first on all the events and i was last on all the events and i remember after that first one swim out and go running up the beach and i got to and there was Dougie was at the finish line already. He was toweled off. I think he was having a sandwich by the time I got there. And uh, so I finally get there. And I, and then this guy was timing it. And I, 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 I was kind of bent over, hold, holding myself up, on, propping myself up on the knees. And I, and I kind of saw in my mouth to Dougie. I said, how did I, did I make it? You know, he says, yeah, no, you're good. You're good. You know, he, so I guess I got there just in time. But I, so then I, they hired me. <laughs> and then the second year, and I, you know, I, I was hired with the city. And then, uh, and then the next year, you know, I was off for the winter time because they, they let everybody go. But the next, that, that summer I was invited back. And I went down to the tower and I said, God, do we have that, that PT stuff? And I said, I got to start training for that. And, and the sergeant there at the time says, no, you've already been on. You don't have to do that, that those events anymore. I said, whoa. <laughs> it's sort of like I say, you know, God, God has had a hand in sparing me through a lot of stuff that I didn't have to do. So anyhow, so, anyhow, so I stayed on for about 10 years. And then, uh, uh, yeah, about a year and a half ago, uh, two years, I guess, I've missed a couple of summers, and it's it's a heartbreak. I I, I, I drive by there and wistfully look out at the, at the tower I used to work in, and and I wish I had my old job back. But it, it's a hearing deal. <laughs> Some doctor just jabbed me on the uh, uh the hearing uh, said I couldn't hear certain s- voices because they were a certain range, mm-hmm. and so, so anyhow, I I got I, I couldn't qualify as a lifeguard anymore, and I, I, you know, I argued that well, I'm not sure that 
the, the hearing is that big a part of lifeguarding, but anyhow, I, I find so. Anyhow, I, I walked away begrudgingly. Now, it seems like along the way, I've I talked to uh, some of the, I guess it's the next generation, maybe a SEALs, mm. a little bit younger than me, maybe 10 years behind me. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's when you were in Coronado that you, you developed a bunch of relationships and mentored a bunch of these, the next generation guys coming up. They all love you. Well, they were wonderful guys. I mean, that's how did that, sure that all come them. about? Well, the, the lifeguarding. Uh, the, there was uh, Sam. Sam was at the beach. Um, uh, Pepper's at the beach. Um, there, were, there were others. Oh, and then Charlie, who was you know uh, Charlie Keating, mm-hmm. who. Uh, wow, he he. I've I'd known him because he was a Sony, mm-hmm. and he would come <laughs> over, and uh, he's just this wonderful kid. Uh, and he started coming over when he was like 13, 14 years mm-hmm. old, and then and um, so you remember him, Chuck Keating, when he was 13, 14 years old. Yeah, because he was coming to Coronado at, for the summer. Right, he would stay at my house. Oh, okay. With well, Dougie, well, and, well, how, how did and, you? How did you? How'd that happen? I mean, what, well, oh, well, um. Uh, his cousin Bobby and and Mikey were uh, their names Wurzelbacher, but they're Keating family mm-hmm. kids. And Charlie was one of their cousins. Got it. One of their eight hundred cousins, you know, and <laughs> Catholics, you know. So uh, they, uh, but so that's how I got acquainted with Charlie and uh, became a dear friend and wonderful guy you know just just a great guy and and so in the summers i mean it's it sounds from talking to some of his friends that you were kind of the reason he decided to go in the teams um i i'm not aware of that i i necessarily i knew i oh well his dad did call me and said hey lance uh charlie's talking about going in the teams do you I said, "Can you help?" I said, "Well, I'll do anything I can." I so I looked and I think I found a name or something. I didn't do much of anything really except refer him to somebody who who really could help him, and so that's how he got in the teams. And then, but I'm real close with that whole family, mm-hmm. and uh, and Charlie, uh, who was killed, dad's name, his name is Charlie also. Mm-hmm. And he knew about my brother Danny, and uh, so there's, a, and then Charlie's brother Billy is also in the teams or was in the teams. I think he's getting out. <coughs> uh, knew about my my brother, and so there's a there's a kinship there mm-hmm. that we we feel as family, and um, we, you know, we we stay in touch, mm-hmm. and on May. I think it's May third is it, the, when Charlie was killed uh, in 2016. Was yeah, it? Yeah, 2016. He was killed. <clears throat> and so, anyhow, Charlie and I, you know, when I go to Rosecrans, I'll take a picture and send mm-hmm. it to him. And and that's one thing good about these damn iPhones. You know, you can communicate. Boom, when you want to. You know. Yeah. And. Um, so. Yeah, he's definitely a, a special guy. I mean, uh, I w- when. He was coming up in the teams, you know. I was mm. in a position where I was teaching land warfare and stuff like that. Oh, so you okay. know, and so I, I would see faces, you know. I'd see guys, yeah. Like, but I, unless someone was either really good or really bad, I probably wouldn't remember me. You know, and he was, you know, one of the guys. Like, I, I remember this guy, and um, but man, like some of the like the stories you hear about about Chuck is just like he was just a freaking epic guy. Um, yeah. And he's one of those guys, you know. You look at all these pictures of him that. You just you just know that this guy was just uh, such an awesome guy to have in your platoon, mm-hmm. and he mm-hmm. left such a mark on so many of the team guy buddies of his, and yeah. uh, got a great thing going now. They got the, the C4 Ranch up here in right. San Diego, which is a, a beautiful place, a bunch of awesome people, and it gives, gives guys a place to be able to go and unwind and take their families yeah. and spend time in nature yeah. and all that kind of stuff, so... The, his his name is is living on, and he's still helping the his his brother seals through that yeah. thing that he's doing. Yeah, I yeah no for sure it's a great legacy, and um, very worthwhile. And and I know his dad's involved, and then uh, Brooke, his wife, I think is really involved. And so yeah, it's 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 important, it's significant, and that yeah they found a great piece of 
property up there, yeah. and I think it, I think it ser- serves a it's filling out the mission in a great way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you retired, I guess, from the lifeguarding yeah. thing. That's yeah. what happened. Right. And so, and so, what are you up to now? Uh, you know, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> drinking beer with the well, drinking Doug, beer with the youngsters, yeah, getting them you in know, trouble. And I, I, <laughs> I, I, I lately, uh, I spend more time feeling sorry for myself than I should. You know, and and then Dougie and I were talking, and um, we. Uh, Actually, um, I got um, involved with with Dougie, um, my son, who, and then this guy Sam uh, Blair down in Louisiana, uh, who was in the teams and then moved to Louisiana, and they they started talking about uh, developing um, a coffee company, and uh, and Dougie and I were just chatting about it, and uh, and I started thinking, God. Is this another wonderful thing that's coming to me that I can participate in? And so Dougie has asked me to, well, we, we just chatted. We just naturally assumed that I would have a, a small role and nothing too responsible <laughs> or that requires any talent or anything, but something that I could be involved myself with. And, uh, I mean, it was... Uh, uh, the God thing again, you know. Maybe, maybe this is a, a blessing of sorts. So, we've just been fiddling around with it for a few weeks, but um, we we want to start this coffee company, and um, and because we're pretty sure we've got a, a great source. There's a guy down in Louisiana uh, who is the sole importer of this uh, of this coffee. And it's grown in Honduras, and the only only importer in the U.S. is importing this coffee, and it's coming from Louisiana, which I love. You know, it's across the lake from New Orleans. I mean, going, you know, and so uh, it's all sort of coming together, and um, and so at eighty two, soon to be eighty three, you know, there were, there were times because uh, like my. My roommate from Tulane, who was 83, a great deal older than me, he was 83, <laughs> and he's told me, he says, "Hey, man, you don't, you don't want to be 83. It's really rough." You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Oh, shucks. Hey, yeah, okay." So, um, anyhow, he's he uh, he's just telling me that uh, it's not good. So there are a couple uh, ever since I got couldn't make couldn't pass a hearing t- test because I'm so goddamn old you know <laughs> so i can't pass a hearing test so i can no longer do what i love to do and uh, be with the people i love to be and you know i'd wake up in the morning and i and I, I i remember one morning i woke up and i looked on my you know just kind of looking over the side of my bed and i could see i could see some dust balls under this table near my bed and i said you know that's probably about the most important thing you got on your list to do today is clean those goddamn puff balls up. And I said, hey, man, life's got to be better than this. we got to do something. And so when we started talking about developing a coffee company, um, I, I'm really excited about it. You know, and I'm with a, uh, I, probably one of those creative guys I know, my fourth child, and uh, he's artistic and comes up with great ideas and he's entrepreneurial in spirit and uh yeah hell yeah we're, <laughs> we're, we're gonna make a coffee company by golly and uh so it's obviously we're just starting it we think it's gonna be great well we know it's gonna be great but uh anyhow i'm that's what i'm doing now i'm a coffee guy now i'm kind of the <laughs> Colonel Sanders of, co- of coffee. Yeah. So I'm pretty what's, excited. What's the name of the coffee company going to be? It's called Big Yellow Coffee. Big Yellow. Mm-hmm. What's that all about? Well, you you do, weren't aware of it when you when you came up to us as a, we were out in the parking lot. But my van. Oh, the van is Big Yellow. Big Yellow. And uh, I've had that puppy since Dougie was a junior in high school, <laughs> and so um, it, uh, it. So that, that we've got. And, you know, because, I, like I say, the guy's artistic as hell. He designed the coffee bag for it and everything. And uh, 
it's the big yellow coffee company. <laughs> and if you don't think the coffee isn't going to go flying off the shelf, man, you haven't lived. It's, it's going to be great. I, I, I really, from what I know about coffee, I, I, I expect to know a lot more from now on, you know. But uh, I, the, 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 the components sound good. I mean, this guy's the sole importer of coffee, of this particular coffee from uh, Honduras. And the thing that's really significant about this coffee guy is that he's the only one that we're going to buy coffee from. And we're, uh, we don't, we're not going to buy, you know, he's a sole uh, distributor. This kind of a sole grower, right? Yeah, he's oh, the guy in Honduras. Oregon, right? uh-huh. Oregon, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a single single origin um, source. Do and we have a, Do we have a website yet? It's in in the works. It's in the works. Yeah. Uh, oh no! What's I, a, What's the website? BigYellowCoffee.com. dot com. Big Big yellow yellow coffee coffee yeah. com. And if uh, if you can't get through right away, just be patient. Uh, <laughs> you'll be able to get in. <laughs> Well, <laughs> it sounds like that brings us up to present date. Probably, probably a good place to stop. Uh, we have to give Echo yes. the opportunity. Yes. You know, I'm sure there's some, maybe some Hawaiian questions coming yes. down oh, the pipe. Sure. What do we got? Very, sure. s- very small but significant. Oh, opinion. sure. Wait, so the place up in Makawao that was a chart house? No, no. It was, well, it was it was mine. It was called Makawao Steakhouse, and I, oh. I owned it myself. Makawao Up Country, also known as Up Country. Maui, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, the what was the name of your canoe club? Heilani. Mm-hmm. Heilani yes. Canoe Club. And then what did you teach at Puno? Uh, I taught fifth grade for the first two years. And then my last year, I, I went from, what, from the fifth grade to uh, the academy, and I taught ninth and tenth grade great English there. Oh, did Barack on. Obama go there? Did you teach Barack Obama? Well, you know, I was I was going to say <laughs> what was interesting is uh, <clears throat> I had I remained in fir- teaching fifth grade, I would have, t- he, he came in that next fifth grade class where I went up to the academy, <laughs> which uh, I, I, again, God, you know, for him, his sake, yeah. he probably... <laughs> he, he was pro- saved by yeah, the bell. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he, he, he would end up a, a surfer somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> he, yeah he may, may have been a great water guy, you know, who knows. But yeah, no, he uh, he dodged a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Chuck Steakhouse and the Outrigger, which Outrigger is that? I mean, back in... Because now Outrigger's everywhere. In yeah. Waikiki. Oh, there, so, there so, are a bunch... Yeah. Oh, nowadays. Oh, yeah. yeah. Every yeah, corner. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, at the at the one right there and the, right there at Waikiki Beach, the um, main one where Dukes is now. Kind right, of. Yeah. Ne- next. Huh. There's yeah. A, there's yeah. A place called Dukes now. Yeah. It was up a couple of floors above. Yeah. 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 Where Dukes is. Okay. Right on. And uh, yeah, next to the Moana Hotel. And, yep. Yep. That's where we stayed last time we went. No, oh, there you go. Boom. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So right the, Dukes. But Chuck, God, he, he's a, he'd be a great. He's another guy. Chuck Chuck Rolls, a guy that started Chuck Steakhouses, wonderful guy. I'm hoping he's still alive, but I I don't know. He's a geezer. We'll, you know? we'll, we'll leave it at what hope he's still alive. We don't have to follow up with a butt on that one. We'll just call <laughs> yeah. it hope he's still yeah, alive. Yeah. I'm sure he's still alive. Mm. Sure, awesome, sure. awesome. Uh, Lance, you got any any closing thoughts you want to close out with? Just thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate well, it. Nice to meet you, Echo, yes, and sir. and and you you too. But uh, yeah, no, I guess that's all. I'm just grateful, and I'm, thank you. Well, right right on. Like I said, uh, it it I actually heard about you through the this young generation of the the kind of I guess the, the generation behind me. I don't want to make myself sound old or make them sound young. They're all grown men. Yeah, that are you know deep into the teams now but those were the guys that kind of told me about what you passed on to them so uh it's awesome to have you on here and and thanks for sharing some of those lessons learned and um thanks for your service and and thanks for the service and sacrifice of of your brother as well um you know we we owe everything to you guys that that put in the work in the early days and and created the the tradition that we all try and uphold so Thanks for joining us, and thanks for everything you and your family have done. Thank you. 
and with that, Lance Mann has left the building. Uh, pretty awesome guy to hang out with for a couple hours. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, just note, multiple times, multiple times he kind of referred to himself as like decrepit and all this stuff. Yeah. This dude's 83 sure. years old, yeah. 82 years old, almost 83 years old. He is not decrepit. No. And he is in great shape. And I'm sure maybe he's not in as good shape as he was when he was 22 years old going through UDT training. Mm-hmm. But um, what an awesome guy. Yeah. And, you know, uh, living it. Yeah. Yeah, you know how you can tell, like, even young people, younger people, whatever, kind of just when they walk up to you and, you know, how they kind of talk and yep. hold themselves and walk from here to there, you can kind of tell. You know, you have a small little gauge of, oh. And, yeah, when he rolls up, it's kind of like, fuck, this guy is pretty impressive for 82, <laughs> just how he's just rolling up. Yeah, well, you know? the, actually, you just don't even think he's 82, yeah, right? You, that, just, yes. you think maybe he looks old for, you know, oh, this guy looks pretty old for a yeah. 51-year-old. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's kind of the, the impression you get yeah. uh, from the way he's carrying himself. So definitely a, a definitely a stud. And pretty cool, um, the fact that he's had this influence on like this younger generation. I hate I, I again. I'm, I'm I sound, I feel like I sound like I'm being condescending when I call the guys kind of whatever behind me, not right behind me, but you know, like ten years, fifteen years behind me in the teams. That's sort of the next generation. I don't even mm-hmm. I don't even know if that means next generation, mm-hmm. but this guy was a real mentor and inspiration to a bunch of those guys. So uh, that's kind of how I heard about him and pretty cool to have him on here and, and talk through some of this stuff and definitely a you know there's a couple things I heard about him it's like one thing I heard about him and I, we didn't bring this up again you know I look back and was like, I, like apparently he just never wears a wetsuit when surfing and stuff <laughs> which is you know this dude is you know we're all like cold cold immersion you know I have an ice bath you know taking a he's just going surfing That's for two hours off. with no wetsuit <laughs> which by the way is cold in Southern California yeah. it's cold it's yeah, not yeah, warm yeah. Hawaii is is warm. Is warm. You yes. don't really need a wetsuit. Did you ever wear a wetsuit when you were sponging in no, Hawaii? No, never. Yeah. No. So you don't really need a wetsuit in Hawaii. Correction, you don't need a wetsuit. You don't. Hawaii. Okay, no. you don't need it's a wetsuit rare. in Hawaii. Especially when you compare to here. Oh, yeah. Even Hoover. the coldest yeah, of yeah. in Hawaii, it's kind of like, okay, I'll get out after three hours. <laughs> Usually it's like eight, nine hours. You can be in the water. Easy. Yeah. That is so luxury, isn't it? Yes. Hawaii is kind of a little bit of paradise, isn't it? In a way, it is. A Can you imagine he moved from Baltimore to Hawaii? Yeah, very different. That's a game changer. So uh, awesome, awesome to have him in, on here. Is you know, uh, obviously it was difficult for him to talk about his brother, even after all these years. Uh, you know, his brother kind of followed his footsteps and and ended up being killed in Vietnam. And you know, I read a little bit about that. He he. Um, they were they were basically in a in a gunfight on an on a ship or on a small boat and um they took some either mortars or rocket fire and ended up killing two seals um lieutenant jg dan man who we talked about but also a, a another seal named last name of boston and then another one named neil who died of wounds later and you know that's another thing that you know you get to hear this incredible life and these adventures that Lance Mann has been on, and you 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 know we know I know he knows that his brother didn't get those opportunities, and that's something that uh, we all need to think about. You know the, all the guys that didn't come home and the fact that we get this opportunity to go and surf without a wetsuit and go and become a lifeguard at 55 years old and go and open up restaurants and move around the world and like all those things are opportunities that we have because of people that made the sacrifice for us. So (sighs) definitely something to think about. Um, With that, thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, Thanks for supporting, you know, we. We did feed Lance Mann some. He had, he had some go. Yeah. He seemed fired up too, by it too. Yeah. When he he was a little surprised when he tasted it. It's like, oh, this is good. Like, yeah. So, if you notice, he didn't touch his water. No, he went. He all, chose the go. He went all go <laughs> he all woke the up time. And chose go. Yeah. yeah. He. It's weird. You ever? 
or I'm sitting here listening to the whole mm-hmm. deal. And then, you know how, it, I don't know, it's like this weird map. Maybe I'm alone on this. Maybe I'm not. But it's this weird map where it's like you kind of think, oh, yeah, when you're like in high school or whatever. It's like that's a certain period of your life. And it's mm-hmm. like you got your whole life ahead of you. Then you get your 20s. Okay. And then your 30s, you kind of hit your groove, 40s. And then once you hit like 50-ish, you kind of are like, okay, you're kind of almost like, the, like retirement. The destined- the destiny is already known. Yeah, exactly. And you're kind of in retirement mode a little bit. You take your foot off the gas, you know, and then 60 is kind of like you're straight up retired. You're cruising. <laughs> That's kind of the map you kind of have maybe subconsciously. And, bro, he's, like, talking about, like, oh, yeah, let me be a lifeguard and making it past the test. I'm like, bro, are you not realizing the map that we're all thinking about <laughs> you? And then you think about it. Oh, wait, he just had a different kind of attitude mm-hmm. where he was like, oh, no, no we're still do- we're still going mm-hmm. right now. They're like, it's not over. Like, we're still yeah. going or whatever. Then you kind of consider it. Oh, wait, you can do that? Yeah. And if you do, it's kind of, I mean, this is just kind of deduction, really, but thinking, man, if you have that attitude, it's kind of like you can live like a whole nother life in a way. 100%. Where he's like 82, bro, let's face it, bro. If I even live to 82, bro, am I going to be like, what the hell? You know, if it, it feels like I'd be, I'd been done for like 20 years already. <laughs> but him, he's just like mad that he's even smelling the doneness, even though he's not, I know, with the coffee thing. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, you said, uh, you said it's not over, right? You, you ever seen like the, the kid in the, wrestling tournament or the kid in the basketball game or whatever and like they're kind of losing yeah yeah but there's one kid that he's not done yet it's not over yet <laughs> right in his mind it's not over like, yeah. well, i'm not done with this we're not done with this game right and sometimes right. that kid can turn spark and come back and make things happen and get the victory yeah uh it's pretty wild it, and so that attitude of it's not you know when my daughter was wrestling uh when she was in trying to make it through to state and in order to make it through to state you got to win first second or third and her first day she lost a match she won a couple she won a few she won quite a few matches but she lost a match which means the next day she was going to have to win every single match mm-hmm. which is hard to do this is this is now high level this isn't playing around right? oh, yeah. you're trying to get to state championships yes. in california which is a big deal mm-hmm. and we're actually out in a place in the Imperial Valley of California called Brawley. Sure. And Brawley is a great uh, athletic school. And they have, cause it's out in the middle of the desert. These are tough, hardworking kids. Their athletic programs are super hardcore because they have nothing else to do. They live in yeah. Brawley, right? Yeah. You know, I got, I, got, I got a friend that's from Brawley, he's in the teams and you know, he's like, you're in Brawley, bro. That's what you're gonna do. You're yeah. just like, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna fight, you're gonna wrestle, you're gonna play football, like that's what you're gonna do. Mm-hmm. So my daughter, she knows that you know that night. She's thinking, she if she loses one match, she's not going to state. This is her senior year, right? Uh, that night, and she was underweight, so she wasn't even close to like the high end of her weight bracket. She probably she could have cut weight a few pounds and gone one way class down, but she didn't do that. Mm. So, anyways, we like she loses. She doesn't even talk to me on the way back to the hotel room. She just angry mm. and 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 not even not she wasn't really angry she was kind of like a little bit sad you know mm. she still wasn't talking to me wasn't talking to anybody we get back to her i said you want something to eat and she says yeah i said what do you want she's like pizza hut <laughs> so we order a bunch of pizza hut whatever <laughs> and you know she's still underweight but she goes out the next day and like i saw a little look in her face that was like it's not over yet <laughs> this isn't over <laughs> and she won her first match. And you could see almost like a sort of vibe coming yeah. over. And then she won her <laughs> next match. And she won her next match. And then it wasn't her last match of the day, but her toughest match of the day. We're in Brawley. And she's wrestling against a girl from Brawley. Mm-hmm. And these girls scrap. Respect to Brawley. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they had a brawl. Then my daughter won. And, and, but you know, it's that attitude. And then she ended up going to States, but mm. that attitude of it's not over yet. Yeah. Right. It's not over. Yeah. And to have that attitude with life, that's a little lesson learned for everybody today. Yeah. A little lesson learned for everybody. It's not over. But I felt it. Yeah. I felt like he was kind of going harder at 82 than I am right now. <laughs> I kind of had that feeling. <laughs> you know, I'd say that's an accurate statement. Uh. Uh, awesome. All right. Um, if you 
want to support the podcast, you want to support yourself, you want to stay in good shape, you want to, you want to get some some Lance Man Jocko Fuel in your system, go to JockoFuel.com, get yourself uh, some energy drinks that are actually good for you. Stay in good shape and in good health. Yes, good, good Keep point. Keep you right in the game. Good point. Keep you right in the game across the board. Get yourself some protein. Look, we can't afford to go to Chart House every night. You know, to get <laughs> sure. right, no, uh, yeah, it's maybe hard. when you're an E5 team guy, like I was an E4 team guy going to Chart House, mm-hmm. we go up there and get that prime rib, boy. So, what is Chart House? It's for? a restaurant, it's a nice restaurant. Oh, restaurant, so it's not like a club. Oh, you didn't even know it was no, it's a restaurant, it's yeah. a straight up restaurant. And there was one in Coronado that was on, it's a different restaurant now, but it was on, it was, it was like a boathouse, it was on the water, mm-hmm. it was like a dock, basically, yeah, yeah. real nice. Yeah. And it was one of those things, too, when you're young, like a young person's like a 20. 20 year old kid isn't supposed to be going to the chart house because you don't have enough money for it unless you're in the team and you're a young <laughs> team guy. Then you're like up there ordering that $22 prime rib back in 91. <laughs> Feeling sure. like you're kind of a boss, right? Kind of, kind yeah. of a boss. Like, oh, hey, yeah. I'm rolling in the chart house. Yeah. You're just like a business person, right? Yeah. There's people in there with like shirts, yeah. like real, like whatever. Nice shirts and stuff, you know? So, so wait, this, so the chart house, what's the dynamic when you go in there? Is it like a military feel? No, 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 It's just more it's, higher it's, end no, kind it's, of scenario. Well, it was created by team guys, right? Yeah. So it's kind of chill. Like the waiters and waitresses would be wearing like Hawaiian shirts. Yeah. But they're also charging, you know, like $29 for a piece of meat, right? So it's, well, and, and that's back then. So like yeah. today it'd be the equivalent of like probably 40 bucks, mm. you know, 50 bucks per per main course yeah yeah so yeah you're right so like a if you're if you don't have some some money yeah. or whatever that's gonna be you're not just casually to to rolling out there yeah, unless yeah. you're a young guy in the teams you have no expenses other than just what you're gonna eat you're gonna get after it <laughs> did you guys uh like know that it was kind of like has the team guy roots? i knew i knew it had team guy roots but no one I, you know, I always thought, well, maybe someone's going to be like, hey, are you guys, are you, know, are you guys in the SEAL teams? No one ever said that to me. Mm-hmm. You know, they just kind of, which is pretty obvious we're in this freaking SEAL teams. We're in corn. We're like literally 500 yeah. meters from base. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think maybe I, what's funny is I thought that the chart house, I thought that I was at like the first chart house in 1990. He's like, no, it started in 1964. <laughs> So I was way yeah. off base on that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting too. He And he didn't go as deep into it. His, uh, Kamaina experience in in Hawaii, but mm-hmm. all those places, it's weird because I kind of think where he, all the places he was talking about, like I know those places mm-hmm. or whatever, but this is back in the day, yeah. so it's like different, you know. <laughs> so it kind of has that contrast or whatever. When he was like outrigger, you know the outrigger, but now bro, outriggers everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the main one, that's the one he was talking about. Yeah, yeah he's talking about that main one that you stay at by Dukes. Yeah. I've been to that one. Oh yeah, it's kind of a hype scenario. That's the hype. They right got there. a they got a bar like on the beach situation. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's where I proposed to my current wife. By the way, you know what? We had a weird scenario with my my wife. The way things kind of finally got solidified. But when I finally got her a ring, sure. let's say, yeah, when yeah. We finally got her a ring. Yeah. I asked her to come out for dinner. We we went out for dinner. Guess where we went to dinner? Chart house. We went to the chart house. Oh, not dude. not even the one in Coronado. Mm. We went to the one that was down by the pier or whatever in San Diego. So it was sort of an extra level of hype. It wasn't just going to Coronado. It yeah, was like, yeah. I'm going to take you extra level of hype. And I had that little, so I told her to get dressed up and what, whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, I put on like a shirt, you know. Like a, <laughs> Because sure. back in the day, it was hard to get a shirt on. You I know? understand. Like really. a t-shirt was kind of hard, but like yeah. putting on a collared shirt was sort of a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So she knew something was up. Some formal. Yeah. Uh, yep. Get yourself yeah, a Jocko Fuel. JockoFuel.com. Get some, get some of the drinks from Wawa. Yeah. Get some, any of it from the vitamin shop. That's going to help you out. Uh, get yourself some clothes. Get yourself some American-made clothes. Straight up. Yeah. Straight up. Is there like a new factory gene or something, or am I just seeing like a factory gene? gene is the same gene we've always had that's called the factory. Two types of genes factory gene, mm-hmm. Delta 68. Mm-hmm. Delta 68 is lighter, a little thinner, factory heavy. So if you're in Michigan or you're in uh, Maine sure. and it's going to be wintertime, get yourself a set of factory Fact. genes. If you're in SoCal, or you're deploying to Vietnam, <laughs> get yourself sure. a pair of Delta 68s. So, and all of it is made in America. All of it's made in America. And, and look, that's the way everything should be made. If you're an American, you should be buying something that's made in America. Why would you not do that? I'll tell you why. Because you think, well, you know, I want to save $14. 
But when you save that $14, you're actually costing yourself infinitely more on the backside when your country is crumbling and when you feel in your soul that you're enslaving human beings overseas. At the very least, keeping them. At the very least, keeping people enslaved overseas. So don't let that happen. Go to originusa.com. Get yourself some boots. Get yourself a gi. Yep. Get yourself a gi, a comfy gi. Yeah. No one even thought that gis were going to be comfortable. No, that wasn't. The, it was sort of, deal. you just had to accept that gis were uncomfortable. Yes. That gis, let's face it, you're going to put a gi on, you're not happy. I felt that way. You're not happy putting on a gi yeah. until now. Now you put on a gi, you kind of smile a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Right? You are correct. You kind of smile a little bit. When you put on a, uh, an origin gi, you kind of feel like, yeah. yeah, oh, that felt, yeah. yeah. A little smile. Yeah. You didn't think it was possible. Yeah. You didn't think it was possible. It's more than possible. It's reality. Yep. Yeah, it's happening. OriginUSA.com. Check some of that out. Also, other clothing. Jocko clothing. Go to JockoStore.com. It's mm-hmm. where you can represent. Discipline equals freedom. It's a big deal. Discipline equals freedom. That goes deep. Mm-hmm. I know you didn't know that when you made it up or whatever, but, but it goes deep. <laughs> you know, uh, Shirt Locker, even Leif Babin, yeah. just did not support the Everyone Must Get Stone t-shirt. Yeah, so that one that one is very controversial, <laughs> but, but it's not for everybody. I did not you know? know that it was going to – I, I – yeah. To me, this is this is this is why I know this is why I don't trust myself. This is why I always question myself. This is why I always think, oh, you know, I might not have the best idea. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who don't know, we made a t-shirt. It's based on – it's for the shirt locker, shirt locker uh, subscription thing, and you get a T-shirt every month. And there, we we can be a little bit more, let's say, uh, uh, creative, creative with the designs. We can take a little bit more risk. We can get a little bit wild. So this is an idea I had forever. Mm-hmm. I thought this was like the best selling T-shirt of all time. This is gonna, everyone's gonna want this one. Like we're yeah. gonna have to back order it. Like a bunch of crazy stuff's gonna happen. We're gonna yeah. see him on, on uh, you know, the cover of uh, fashion magazines throughout the world. <laughs> So sure. there's a story about Vietnam. Guy has a stoner rifle. We used a, a weapon called the stoner, the stoner 63 in Vietnam. SEALs used it. We were famous for using it. And a guy I knew got went and picked up his weapon from the armory. And someone else that had taken the weapon to Vietnam on an alternate tour had carved into the buttstock, everybody must get stoned. And I thought, that, oh, that's so cool. You know, mm-hmm. it's the 60s. That's a song by Bob Dylan. I think yeah, everybody mm-hmm. must get stoned. So I thought, hey, dude, of course, we'll make a T-shirt. And people just didn't <laughs> get it, man. And it's not well, even just some people don't like it because there's a machine gun on it. Mm-hmm. Some people don't like it because it says get stoned on it. Yep. You put those two things together. The only people that are going to like it is like me and like one other <laughs> person, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Me. I like. Yeah. That. So anyways, well, you're going to roll the dice a little bit, I guess. I, apparently. I, we never ran into that. But hey, man. That's the only one that's kind of gotten the neg, the negative feedback. No, 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 no. There's always going to be your odd guy like, you know, or person, whatever, uh-huh. who's like not liking something so <laughs> hey man and i dig it it's not for everybody we knew that yeah, going in yeah, you know yeah. but uh yeah sometimes i guess apparently sometimes these shirts go hard you know yeah so if you're feeling edgy, edgy. Or if you want to support yeah. kind of just look like like give the support and you also want to take risks because yeah, you're true. a risk taker you're the kind of person that says you know what i'm in the game <laughs> you know what it's true. you know it's what true. you're saying to yourself it's not over I'm not done wearing cool T-shirts. I'm not, it's not over yet. Yep. You can you can check out the shirt locker. <laughs> yep. And that is on Jocko Store. Yep. Dot com. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget about Jocko Underground. We're putting we're putting a word out on Jocko Underground, answering questions on that. JockoUnderground.com. If you want to check that out, we got a YouTube channel. Putting videos up. You can see what Lance Man looks like. You can see what eighty two should look like should if you're like squared that. away. Yes. If you're PT every day. Mm. Uh, so check that out, Psychological Warfare. We got flipsidecanvas.com, Dakota Meyer. Got a bunch of books. Hey, I read, I kind of reread a section from By Water Beneath the Walls. I, I guess that might be bad planning or whatever, but that section about the UDTs and the psychological, I just yeah. had to kind of go with it again. But that book is Ben Milligan, uh, By Water Beneath the Walls. Freaking great book. You know, I've written a bunch of books too, including a novel called Final Spin. Check those out, leadership books and whatnot. Kids books. If you haven't gotten all the kids you know, all the kids books that I've written, you're not a good person. <laughs> you're not. Up. You're not. You're not a good person. Okay. Right? Yeah. You're not. 
You don't care about them. Yeah, it's hard to connect those dots. You know, good person, no books. I, I, I understand fully. Wait, you saying it's hard to connect those dots? Yeah, like if you if you consider yourself a good person, meanwhile you didn't do the book thing. Right, it's you, hard. Yeah, you're you're you're, you're hard. You're a hard time convincing me that you're a good person Dude. when you're like, oh yeah, well I know a bunch of kids, but I didn't get any of this yeah. life changing book that's going to help them in every way and yeah. everything that they do in their life. No, when you look in the mirror, you should recognize you're a bad person. <laughs> So don't do it. Sure. Get all these kids. Just get them. Hand them out. Hand them out. I can't hand all these books out myself. What am I going to do? Like walk yeah. around America handing out books? No. You got to do it. Mm-hmm. Get in the game. Buy them and give them to all these kids. Help out all these kids. <laughs> there you go. Echelonfront.com if you need help with leadership inside your organization. Don't forget about extremeownership.com where we got online training. And if you want to help service members active and retire, active and retired service members you want to help their families out you want to help out gold star families check out mark lee's mom she's got a a charity organization it's at america's mighty warriors.org also check out heroes and horses.com where michael finn's got cool stuff going on letting people get back to themselves uh as far as the the social media thing where the algorithm is hunting you look just because there's bad things out there in the world doesn't mean you, you need to like shy away from it, but you got to be on your toes when you go in there, all right? So you go in there and check out echocharles.com, you check out jockowink.com, be on your toes, watch out for the algorithm. It'll get you. And uh, thanks once again. Thanks once again to Lance Mann for coming on. And, and thanks to Dan Mann, his brother, who... Who died on April 7th, 1967, in service to our great nation. We are grateful for your sacrifice and we will not forget. And on top of that, thanks to all the UDT frogmen of the past who laid down the foundation of the organization that this generation has done our best to uphold. And to the rest of the members, past and present of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, who also continue to hold up the warrior traditions of our great nation, thank you for your service. And thanks also for the work done by our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, all the first responders out there, thanks for your service here on the home front to keep us safe. And to every, everyone else out there, let's keep it in mind that it's not over. It's not over. You got one shot. You got one go at this gig. And I recommend that you be like Lance Mann and live it. Go out there and live it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.